Section 20 of Now It Can Be Told by Philip Gibbs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 7. The Fields of Armageddon. Chapters 1 to 5. Chapter 1. During the two years that followed the Battles of the Somme, I recorded in my daily dispatches, republished in book form, The Struggle in Flanders and the Way to Victory, the narrative of that continuous conflict in which the British forces on the Western Front were at death grips with the German monster, where now one side and then the other heaved themselves upon their adversary and struggled for the knockout blow, until at last, after staggering losses on both sides, the enemy was broken to bits in the last combined attack by British, Belgian, French, and American armies. There's no need for me to retell all that history in detail, and I am glad to know that there is nothing I need alter in the record of events which I wrote as they happened, because they have not been falsified by any new evidence, and those detailed descriptions of mine stand true in fact and in the emotion of the hours that passed, while masses of men were slaughtered in the fields of Armageddon. But now, looking back upon those last two years of the war, as an eye-witness for many tragic and heroic things, I see the frightful drama of them as a whole, and as one act was related to another, and as the plot, which seems so tangled and confused, led by inevitable stages, not under the control of any field marshal or chief of staff, to the climax in which empires crashed, and exhausted nations looked round upon the ruin which followed defeat and victory. I see also, as in one picture, the colossal scale of that human struggle in that Armageddon of our civilization, which at the time one reckoned only by each day's success or failure, each day's slaughter on that side or the other. One may add up the whole sum, according to the bookkeeping of fate, by double entry, credit and debit, profit and loss. One may set our attacks in the battles of Flanders against the strength of the German defense, and say our losses of three to one, as Ludendorff reckons them, and as many of us guessed, were in our favor because we could afford the difference of exchange, and the enemy could not put so many human counters into the pool of the final kitty in this gamble with life and death. One may balance the German offensive in March of 18 with the weight that was piling up against them by the entry of the Americans. One may also see now very clearly the paramount importance of the human factor in this arithmetic of war, the morale of men being of greater influence than generalship, though dependent on it, and spirit of peoples being as vital to success as the mechanical efficiency of the war machine. And above all, one is now able to observe how each side blundered on in a blind, desperate way, sacrificing masses of human life without a clear vision of the consequences, until at last one side blundered more than another and was lost. It will be impossible to pretend in history that our high command or any other foresaw the thread of plot as it was unraveled to the end and so arranged its plan that events happened according to design. The events of March 1918 were not foreseen nor prevented by French or British. The ability of our generals was not imaginative nor inventive, but limited to the piling up of men and munitions, always more men and more munitions, against positions of enormous strength and overcoming obstacles by sheer weight of flesh and blood and high explosives. They were not cunning, so far as I could see, nor in the judgment of the men under their command, but simple and straightforward gentlemen who said, Once more unto the breach and sent up new battering rams by brigades and divisions. There was no evidence that I could find of high-directing brains choosing the weakest spot in the enemy's armor and piercing it with a sharp sword, or avoiding a direct assault against the enemy's most formidable positions and leaping upon him from some unguarded way. Perhaps that was impossible in the conditions of modern warfare and the limitations of the British front until the arrival of the tanks, which for a long time were wasted in the impassable bogs of Flanders, where their steel skeletons still lie rusting as a proof of heroic efforts vainly used. Possible or not, and rare genius alone could prove it one way or another, 
it appeared to the onlooker as well as to the soldier who carried out commands that our method of warfare was to search the map for a place which was strongest in the enemy's lines most difficult to attack most powerfully defended and then after due advertisement not to take an unfair advantage of the enemy to launch the assault that had always been the english way and that was our way in many battles of the great war which were won unless they were lost by the sheer valor of men who at great cost smashed their way through all obstructions the germans on the whole showed more original genius in military science varying their methods of attack and defense according to circumstances building trenches and dugouts which we never equaled inventing the concrete blockhouse or pillbox for a forward defensive zone thinly held in advance of the main battle zone in order to lessen their slaughter under the weight of our gunfire it cost us dearly for a time scattering their men in organized shell craters in order to distract our barrage fire using the elastic system of defense which frightful successes against neville's attack in champagne creating the system of assault of infiltration which broke the italian lines at copretto in 1917 and ours and the french in 1918 against all that we may set only our tanks which in the end led the way to victory but the german high command blundered atrociously in all the larger calculations of war so that they brought about the doom of their empire by a series of acts which would seem deliberate if we had not known that they were merely blind with a folly that still seems incredible they took the risk of adding the greatest power in the world in numbers of men and in potential energy to their list of enemies at a time when their own manpower was on the wane with deliberate arrogance they flouted the united states and forced her to declare war their temptation of course was great the british naval blockade was causing severe suffering by food shortage to the german people and denying them access to raw material which they needed for the machinery of war the submarine campaign ruthlessly carried out would and did inflict immense damage upon british and allied shipping and was a deadly menace to england but german calculations were utterly wrong as ludendorff in his memoirs now admits in estimating the amount of time needed to break her bonds by submarine warfare before america could send over great armies to europe the german war lords were wrong again in underestimating the defensive and offensive success of the british navy and mercantile marine against submarine activities by those miscalculations they lost the war in the long run and by other errors they made their loss more certain one mistake they made was their utter callousness regarding the psychology and temper of their soldiers and civilian population they put a greater strain upon them than human nature could bear and by driving their fighting men into one shambles after another while they doped their people with false promises which were never fulfilled they sowed the seeds of revolt and despair which finally launched them into gulfs of ruin i have read nothing more horrible than the cold-blooded cruelty of ludendorff's memoirs in which without any attempt at self-excuse he reveals himself as using the lives of millions of men upon a gambling chance of victory with the hazards weighted against him as he admits writing in january nineteen seventeen he says quotes, a collapse on the part of russia was by no means to be contemplated and was indeed not reckoned upon by anyone failing the u-boat campaign we reckoned with the collapse of the quadruple alliance during nineteen seventeen End of quotes. yet with that enormous risk visible ahead ludendorff continued to play the grand jeu and great game and did not advise any surrender of imperial ambitions in order to obtain a peace for his people and was furious with the majority party in the reichstag for preparing a peace resolution the collapse of russia inspired him with new hopes of victory in the west and again he prepared to sacrifice masses of men in the slaughter fields but he blundered again and this time fatally his timetable was out of gear the u-boat war had failed american manhood was pouring into france and german soldiers on the russian front 
had been infected with ideas most dangerous to German discipline and the will to win. At the end, as at the beginning, the German warlords failed to understand the psychology of human nature as they had failed to understand the spirit of France, of Belgium, of Great Britain, and of America. One of the most important admissions in history is made by Ludendorff when he writes, quotes, Looking back, I say our decline began clearly with the outbreak of the revolution in Russia. On the one side, the government was dominated by the fear that the infection would spread, and on the other, by the feeling of their helplessness to instill fresh strength into the masses of the people and to strengthen their warlike ardor, waning as it was through a combination of innumerable circumstances. End of quotes. So the web of fate was spun, and men who thought they were directing the destiny of the world were merely caught in those woven threads like puppets tied to strings and made to dance. It was the old dance of death, which had happened before in the folly of mankind. Chapter 2 During the German retreat to their Hindenburg line, we saw the full ruthlessness of war, as never before on the Western Front, in the laying waste of a beautiful countryside, not by rational fighting, but by carefully organized destruction. Ludendorff claims, quite justly, that it was in accordance with the laws of war. That is true. It is only that our laws of war are not justified by any code of humanity above that of primitive savages. The decision to retreat, he says, was not reached without a painful struggle. It implied a confession of weakness that was bound to raise the morale of the enemy and to lower our own but as it was necessary for military reasons we had no choice it had to be carried out the whole movement was a brilliant performance the retirement proved in a high degree remunerative it was a brilliant performance in its operation i went into beautiful little towns like peron where the houses were being gutted by smoldering fire and into hundreds of villages where the enemy had just gone out of them after touching off explosive charges which had made all their cottages collapse like card houses. Their roofs spread flat upon their ruins, and their churches, after centuries of worship in them, fall into chaotic heaps of masonry. I wandered through the ruins of old French chateaux, once very stately in their terraced gardens, now a litter of brickwork, broken statuary, and twisted ironwork above open vaults where not even the dead had been left to lie in peace. I saw the little old fruit trees of French peasants sawn off at the base, and the tall trees along the roadsides stretched out like dead giants to bar our passage. Enormous craters had been blown in the roadways, which had to be bridged for our traffic of men and guns, following hard upon the enemy's retreat. There was a queer sense of illusion as one traveled through this desolation. At a short distance many of the villages seemed to stand as before the war one expected to find inhabitants there, but upon close approach one saw that each house was but an empty shell blown out from cellar to roof, and one wandered through the streets of the ruins in a silence that was broken only by the sound of one's own voice, or by a few shells crashing into the gutted houses. The enemy was in the next village, or the next but one, with a few field guns and a rear guard of machine gunners. In most villages, in many of his dugouts, and by contraptions, with objects lying amid the litter, he had left booby traps to blow our men to bits if they knocked a wire, or stirred an old boot, or picked up a fountain pen, or walked too often over a board where beneath acid was eating through a metal plate to a high explosive charge. I little knew when I walked around the tower of the town hall of Bopalme that in another week with the enemy far away, it would go up in dust and ashes. Only a few of our men were killed or blinded by these monkey tricks. Our engineers found most of them before they were touched off. But one went down dugouts or into ruined houses with a sense of imminent danger. All through the devastated region, one walked with an uncanny feeling of an evil spirit left behind by masses of men whose bodies had gone away. It exuded from scraps of old clothing. 
It was in the stench of the dugouts and in the ruins they had made. In some few villages there were living people left behind, some hundreds in Nessel and Roy, and all told some thousands. They had been driven in from other villages around them, their own villages, whose devastation they wept to see. I met these people who had lived under German rule and talked with many of them, old women, wrinkled like dried-up apples, young women, waxen of skin, hollow-eyed, with sharp cheekbones, old peasant farmers and the gamekeepers of French chateaux, and young boys and girls pinched by years of hunger that was not quite starvation. It was from these people that I learned a good deal about the psychology of German soldiers during the battles of the Somme. They told me of the terror of these men, at the increasing fury of our gunfire, of their desertion and revolt to escape the slaughter, and of their rage against the great people who used them for gun fodder. Eventually many of them talked of the war as the great swindle. These French civilians hated the Germans in the mass with a cold, deadly hatred. They spoke with shrill passion at the thought of German discipline, fines, punishments, requisitions, which they had suffered in these years. The hope of vengeance was like water to parched throats. Yet I noticed that nearly every one of these people had something good to say about some German soldier who had been billeted with them. He was like a good-natured fellow. He chopped wood for me and gave the children his own bread. He wept when he told me that the village was to be destroyed. Even some of the German officers had deplored this destruction. The world will have a right to call us barbarians, said one of them in Ham. But what can we do? We are under orders. If we do not obey, we shall be shot. It is the cruelty of the high command. It is the cruelty of war. On the whole, it seemed that they had not misused the women. I heard no tales of actual atrocity, though some of brutal passion. But many women shrugged their shoulders when I questioned them about this and said, They had no need to use violence in their way of love-making. There were many volunteers. They rubbed their thumbs and fingers together as though touching money and said, You understand? I understood when I went to a convent in Amiens and saw a crowd of young mothers with flaxen hair babies, just arrived from the liberated districts. All those are children of German fathers, said the old Reverend Mother. That is the worst tragedy of war. How will God punish all this? Alas, it is the innocent who suffer for the guilty. Eighteen months later, or thereabouts, I went into a house in Cologne, where a British outpost was on the Hohenzollern Bridge. There was a baby's creche in an upper room, and a German lady was tending thirty little ones, whose chorus of Guten Tag, Guten Tag, was like the quacking of ducks. After tomorrow there will be no more milk for them, she said. And then I said, and then many of them will die. She wept a little. I thought of those other babies in Amiens, and of the old Reverend Mother. How will God punish all this? Alas, it is the innocent who suffer for the guilty. Of those things General Ludendorff does not write in his memoirs, which deal with the strategy and machinery of war. CHAPTER Three. Sir Douglas Haig was not misled into the error of following up the German retreat across that devastated country with masses of men. He sent forward outposts to keep in touch with the German rearguards, and prepared to deliver big blows at the Vimy Ridge and the lines round Arras. This new battle by German troops was dictated by French strategy rather than by ours. General Nivelle, the new Generalissimo, was organizing a great offensive in the Champagne, and desired the British army to strike first and keep on striking in order to engage and exhaust German divisions until he was ready to launch his own legions. The secret of his preparations was known by every officer in the French army, and by Hindenburg and his staff, who prepared a new method of defense to meet it. The French officers with whom I talked were supremely confident of success. We shall go through, they said. It is certain. Anybody who thinks otherwise is a traitor who betrays his country by the poison of pessimism. Nivelle would deal the death blow. 
So spoke an officer of the Chaussee Alpine and a friend in the infantry of the line over a cup of coffee in an estaminet, crammed with other French soldiers who were on their way to the Champagne front. Nivelle did not launch his offensive until April 16th, seven days after the British had captured the heights of Vimy and gone far to the east of Arras. Hindenburg was ready. He adopted his elastic system of defense, which consisted in withdrawing the main body of his troops beyond the range of the French barrage fire, leaving only a few outposts to camouflage the withdrawal and be sacrificed for the sake of the others. Those German outposts must have disliked their martyrdom under orders, and I doubt whether they, poor devils, were exhilarated by the thought of their heroic service. He also withdrew the full power of his artillery beyond the range of French counter-battery work, and to such a distance that when it was the German turn to fire, the French infantry would be beyond the effective protection of their own guns. They were to be allowed an easy walk through to their death trap. That is what happened. The French infantry, advancing with masses of black troops in the colonial corps, in the front line of assault, all exultant and inspired by the belief in victory, swept through the forward zone of the German defenses, astonished and then disconcerted by the scarcity of Germans, until an annihilating barrage fire dropped upon them and smashed their human waves. From French officers and nurses I heard appalling tales of this tragedy. The death wail of the black troops froze the blood of Frenchmen with horror. Their own losses were immense in a bloody shambles. I was told by French officers that their losses on the first day of battle were 150,000 casualties, and these figures were generally believed. They were not so bad as that, though terrible. Semi-official figures state that the operations, which lasted from April 16th to April 25th, cost France 28,000 killed on the field of battle, 5,000 who died of wounds in hospital, 4,000 prisoners, and 80,000 wounded. General Nivelle's offensive was called off, and French officers who said, We shall break through, it is certain, now said, We came up against a bec de gaz. As you English would say, we got it in the neck. It is a great misfortune. The Battle of Arras, in which the British Army was engaged, began on April 9th and Easter Sunday, when there was a gale of sleet and snow. From ground near the old city of Arras, I saw the preliminary bombardment when the Vimy Ridge was blasted by a hurricane of fire and the German lines beyond Arras were tossed up in earth and flame. From one of old Vauban's earthworks outside the walls, I saw lines of our men going up an assault beyond the suburbs of Blagny and Saint Laurent to Rolincourt, through a veil of sleet and smoke. Our gunfire was immense and devastating, and the first blow that fell upon the enemy was overpowering. The Vimy Ridge was captured from end to end by the Canadians on the left and the 51st Division of Highlanders on the right. By the afternoon, the entire living German population, more than 7,000 in the tunnels of Vimy, were down below in the valley on our side of the lines, and on the ridge were many of their dead, as I saw them afterward horribly mangled by shell-fire in the upheaved earth. The Highland Division, commanded by General Harper, Uncle Harper, he was called, had done as well as the Canadians, though they had less honor, and took as many prisoners. H.D. was their divisional sign, as I saw it stenciled on many ruined walls throughout the war. Well, General, said the Scottish sergeant, they don't call us Harper's duds any more. On the right, English county troops of the 12th Division, 3rd Division, and others, the 15th Scottish and the 36th London, had broken through deeply and widely, capturing many men and guns after hard fighting round machine-gun redoubts. That night, masses of German prisoners suffered terribly from a blizzard in the barbed-wire cages at Etron near Arras, where Julius Caesar had his camp for a year in other days of history. They herded together with their bodies bent to the storm, each man sheltering his fellow and giving a little human warmth. All night through, German commandant sat in our intelligence hut with his head bowed on his breast. Every now and then he said, 
it is cold it is cold and our men lay out in the captured ground around arras and on the vimy ridge under harassing fire and machine-gun fire cold too in that wild blizzard with british dead and german dead in the mangled earth about them ludendorff admits the severity of that defeat Quotes, the battle near arras on april ninth formed a bad beginning to the capital fighting during this year april tenth and the succeeding days were critical days a breach twelve thousand to fifteen thousand yards wide and as much as six thousand yards and more in depth is not a thing to be mended without more ado it takes a good deal to repair the inordinate wastage of men and guns as well as munitions that results from such a breach it was the business of the supreme command to provide reserves on a large scale but in view of the troops available and of the war situation it was simply not possible to hold a second division in readiness behind each division that might perhaps be about to drop out a day like april ninth upset all calculations it was a matter of days before a new front could be formed and consolidated even after the troops were ultimately in line the issue of the crisis depended as always in such cases very materially upon whether the enemy followed up his initial success with a fresh attack and by fresh successes made it difficult for us to create a firm front in view of the weakening of the line that inevitably resulted such successes were only too easy to achieve from april tenth onward the english attacked in the breach in great strength but after all not in the grand manner they extended their attack on both wings especially to the southward as far as Brunnencourt. on april eleventh they gained monchy while we during the night before the twelfth evacuated the vimy heights april twenty third and twenty eighth and also may third were again days of heavy pitched battle in between there was some bitter local fighting the struggle continued we delivered minor successful counter-attacks and on the other hand lost ground slightly at various points End of quotes. i remember many pictures of that fighting around arras in the days that followed the first day i remember the sinister beauty of the city itself when there was surging traffic of men and guns through its ruined streets in spite of long-range shells which came crashing into the houses our soldiers in their steel hats and goatskin coats looked like medieval men-at-arms the highlanders who crowded arras had their pipe bands there and they played in the petit palace and the skirl of the pipes shattered against the gables of old houses there were tunnels beneath arras through which our men advanced to the german lines and i went along when one line of men was going into battle and another was coming back wounded some of them blind bloody vomiting with fumes of gas in their lungs their steel hats clinking as they groped past one another in vaults each side of these passages men played cards on barrels to the light of candles stuck in bottles or slept until their turn to fight with gas masks for their pillows outside the citadel of arras built by vauban under louis the fourteenth there were long queues of wounded men taking their turn to the surgeons who were working in a deep crypt with a high vaulted roof one day there were three thousand of them silent patient muddy blood-stained blind boys or men with smashed faces swathed in bloody rags groped forward to the dark passage leading to the vault led by comrades on the grass outside lay men with leg wounds and stomach wounds the way past the station to the arras cambri road was a death trap for our transport and i saw the bodies of horses and men horribly mangled there dead horses were thick on each side of an avenue of trees on the southern side of the city lying in their blood and bowels the traffic policeman on point duty on the arras cambri road had an impassive face under a steel helmet as though in piccadilly circus only turned his head a little at the scream of a shell which plunged through a gable of a corner house above him there was a pioneer battalion along the road out to observatory ridge which was a german target they were mending the road beyond the last trench through which our men had smashed their way they were busy with bricks and shovels 
only stopping to stare at shells plowing holes in the fields on each side of them. When I came back one morning, a number of them lay covered with blankets, as though asleep. They were dead, but their comrades worked on grimly, with no joy of labor in their sweat. Onchi Hill was the key position, high above the valley of the Scarp. I saw it first when there was a white village there, hardly touched by fire, and afterward when there was no village. I was in the village below Observatory Ridge on the morning of April 11th, when cavalry was massed on that ground, waiting for orders to go into action. The headquarters of the cavalry division was in the ditch covered by planks, and the cavalry generals and their staff sat huddled together with maps over their knees. "'I'm afraid the general is busy for the moment,' said a young staff officer on top of the ditch. He looked about the fields and said, "'It's very unhealthy here.' I agreed with him. The bodies of many young soldiers lay about. Five point nines were coming over in a haphazard way. It was no ground for cavalry, but some squadrons of the Tenth Hussars, Essex Yeomanry, and the Blues were ordered to take Monchi, and rode up the hill in a flurry of snow, and were seen by German gunners and slashed by shrapnel. Most of their horses were killed in the village or outside it, and the men suffered many casualties, including their general, Bulky Johnson whose body I saw carried back on a stretcher to the ruin of Tilly, where crumps were bursting. It is an astonishing thing that two withered old Frenchwomen stayed in the village all through the fighting. When our troops rode in, these women came running forward, frightened and crying, Comrade, as though in fear of the enemy. When our men surrounded them, they were full of joy and held up their scraggy old faces to be kissed by these troopers. Afterward, Monchi was filled with the fury of shell-fire, and the troopers crawled out from the ruins, leaving the village on the hill to be attacked and captured again by our infantry of the 15th and 37th Divisions, who were also badly hammered. Heroic folly! The cavalry in reserve below Observatory Hill stood to their horses, staring up at a German airplane which came overhead, careless of our archies. The eye of the German pilot must have widened at the sight of that mass of men and horses. He carried back glad tidings to the guns. One of the cavalry officers spoke to me. You look ill. No, I'm all right, only cold. The officer himself looked worn and haggard after a night in the open. Do you think the Germans will get their range as far as this? I'm nervous about the men and the horses. We've been here for hours, and it seems no good. I did not remind him that the airplane was undoubtedly the herald of long-range shells. They came within a few minutes. Some men and horses were killed. I was with a Highland officer, and we took cover in a ditch, not more than breast-high. Shells were bursting damnably close, scattering us with dirt. "'Let's strike away from the road,' said Major Shyack. "'They always tape it out.' We struck across country, back to Arras, glad to get there other men had to stay. The battles to the east of Arras that went before the capture of Monchi and followed it were hard, nagging actions along the valley of the Scarp, which formed a glacis where our men were terribly exposed to machine-gun fire and suffered heavily day after day, week after week, for no object apparent to our battalion officers and men who did not know that they were doing teamwork for the French. The Londoners of the 56th Division made a record advance through Neuville Vitasse to Hanin and Hanenel, and broke a switch line of the Hindenburg system across the little Coju River by Wancourt. There was a fatal attack in the dark on May 3rd, when East Kents and Surreys and Londoners saw a gray dawn come, revealing the enemy between them and our main line, and had to hack their way through it if they could. There were many who could not, and even divisional generals were embittered by these needless losses and by the hard driving of their men, saying fierce things about our high command. Their language was mild compared with that of some of our young officers. I remember one I met near Hanin. He was one of a group of three, all gunner officers, who were looking about for better gun positions, not so clearly visible to the enemy, who was in two little woods 
the bois de saint and bois vert which stared down upon them like green eyes some of their guns had been destroyed many of their horses killed some of their men a few minutes before our meeting a shell had crashed into a bath close to their hut where men were washing themselves the explosion filled the bath with blood and bits of flesh the young officer stared at me under the tilt forward of his steel hat and said hello gibbs i had played chess with him at groom's cafe in fleet street in days before the war i went back to his hut and had tea with him close to the bath hoping that we should not be cut up with the cake there were noises off as they say in stage directions which were enormously disconcerting to one's peace of mind and not very far off i had heard before some hard words about our generalship and staff work but never anything so passionate so violent as from that gunner officer his view of the business was summed up in a word murder he raged against the impossible orders sent down from headquarters against the brutality with which men were left in the line week after week and against the monstrous abominable futility of all our so-called strategy his nerves were in rags as i could see by the way in which his hand shook when he lighted one cigarette after another his spirit was in a flame of revolt against the misery of his sleeplessness filth and imminent peril of death every shell that burst near hanin sent a shudder through him i stayed an hour in his hut and then went away toward neuville Vitas, with harassing fire following along the way i looked back many times to the valley and to the ridges where the enemy lived above it invisible but deadly the sun was setting and there was a tawny glamour in the sky and a mystical beauty over the landscape despite the desert that war had made there leaving only white ruins and slaughtered trees where once there were good villages with church spires rising out of sheltering woods the german gunners were doing their evening hate crumps were bursting heavily again amid our gun positions Heninel was not a choice spot there were other places of extreme unhealthfulness where our men had fought their way up to the hindenburg line or as the germans called it the siegfried line Cossil and chaussy were targets of german guns and i saw them ravaging among the ruins and dodged them but our men who lived close to these places stayed there too long to dodge them always they were inhabitants not visitors the australians settled down in front of bullicourt captured it after many desperate fights which left them with a bitter grudge against tanks which had failed them and some english troops who were held up on the left while they went forward and were slaughtered the fourth australian division lost three thousand men in an experimental attack directed by the fifth army they made their gun emplacements in the Noril valley the valley of death as they called it and australian gunners made little slit trenches and scuttled into them when the germans ranged on their batteries blowing gun spokes and wheels and breech blocks into the air Comte, the bastion of the hindenburg line stared straight down the valley and it was evil ground as i knew when i went walking there with another war correspondent and an australian officer who at a great pace led us round about amid five point nines and debouched a little to see one of our ammunition dumps exploding like a brock's benefit and chattered brightly under woolly bears which made a rending tumult above our heads i think he enjoyed his afternoon out from staff work in the headquarters huts afterward i was told that he was mad but i think he was only brave i hated those hours but put on the mask that royalty wears when it takes on intelligent interest in factory work the streams of wounded poured down into the casualty clearing stations day by day week by week and i saw the crowded butchers shops of war where busy surgeons lopped at limbs and plugged men's wounds yet in those days as before and afterward as at the beginning and it's at the end the spirits of british soldiers kept high unless their bodies were laid low between battles they enjoyed their spells of rest behind the lines in that early summer of seventeen 
there was laughter in arras lots of fun in spite of high velocities and music of massed pipers and brass bands jolly comradeship in billets with panelled walls upon which perhaps robespierre's shadow had fallen in the candlelight before the revolution when he was a good young man of arras as a guest of the gordons of the fifteenth division i listened to the pipers who marched round the table and stood behind the colonel's chair and mine and played the martial music of scotland until something seemed to break in my soul and my eardrums i introduced a french friend to the mess and as a guest of honor he sat next to the colonel and the eight pipers played behind his chair he went pale deadly white and presently swooned off his chair and the gordons thought it was the finest tribute to their pipes the officers danced reels in stocking feet with challenging cries gaelic exhortations with fine grace and passion though they were tangled sometimes in the maze many of them fell in the fields outside or in the bogs of flanders on the western side of arras there were field sports by london men and surreys buffs sussex norfolk suffolks and devons they played cricket between their turns in the line lived in the sunshine of the day and did not look forward to the morrow at such times one found no trace of war's agony in their faces or their eyes nor in the quality of their laughter my dwelling place at that time with other war correspondents was in an old white chateau between st paul and hedin from which we motored out to the line arras way or vimy way for those walks in queer street the contrast of our retreat with that armageddon beyond was profound and bewildering behind the old white house were winding walks through little woods beside the stream which henry crossed on his way to agincourt tapestried in early spring with bluebells and daffodils and all the flowers that ronsard wove into his verse in the springtime of france birds sang their love songs in the thickets the tits twittered fearfully at the laugh of the jay all that beauty was like a sharp pain at one's heart after hearing the close tumult of the guns and trudging over the blasted fields of war in the routine of our task week by week month by month this makes for madness said a friend of mine a musician surprised to find himself a soldier in the morning we see our boys with their heads blown off that morning beyond the pont de jour and Telles, we had passed a group of headless boys and another coming up stared at them with a silly smile and said they've copped it all right and went on to the same risk and we had crouched below mounds of earth when shells had scattered dirt over us and scared us horribly so that we felt a little sick in the stomach and in the afternoon we walked through this garden where the birds are singing there's no sense in it it's just midsummer madness but only one of us went really mad and tried to cut his throat and died one of the best as i knew him at his best chapter four the battles of the third army beyond arras petered out and on june seventh there was the battle of messines and witschete when the second army revealed its mastery of organization and detail it was the beginning of a vastly ambitious scheme to capture the whole line of ridges through flanders of which this was the southern hook and then to liberate the belgian coast as far inland as bruges by a combined sea and land attack with shore-going tanks directed by the fourth army this first blow at the messines ridge was completely and wonderfully successful due to the explosion of seventeen enormous mines under german positions followed by an attack in depth divisions passing through each other or leapfrogging as it was called to the final objectives against an enemy demoralized by the earthquake of the explosions for two years there had been fierce underground fighting at hill sixty and elsewhere when our tunnelers saw the germans had listened to one another's workings racing to strike through first to their enemy's galleries and touch off their high explosive charges our miners aided by the magnificent work of australian and canadian tunnelers had beaten the enemy into sheer terror of their method of fighting and they had abandoned it believing that we had also but we had not as they found to their cost 
I had seen the working of the tunnelers up by Hill 70 and elsewhere. I had gone into the darkness of the tunnels, crouching low, striking my steel hat with sharp, spine-jarring knocks against the low beams overhead, coming into galleries where one could stand upright and walk at ease in electric light, hearing the vibrant hum of great engines, the murmur of men's voices in dark crypts, seeing numbers of men sleeping on bunks in the gloom of caverns close beneath the German lines, and listening through a queer little instrument called a microphone, by which I heard the scuffle of German feet in German galleries a thousand yards away, the dropping of a pick or shovel, the knocking out of German pipes against charcoal stoves. It was by that listening instrument, more perfect than the enemy's, that we had beaten him, and by the grim determination of those underground men of ours, whose skin was the color of the chalk in which they worked, who coughed in the dampness of the caves, and who packed high explosives at the shaft heads, hundreds of tons of it, for the moment when the button should be touched far away, and an electric current would pass down a wire, and the enemy and his works would be blown into dust. That moment came at Hill 60, and sixteen other places below the Wischeda and Messine Ridge, at three-thirty on the morning of June seventh, after a quiet night of war, when a few of our batteries had fired in a dulcetory way, and the enemy had sent over some flocks of gas shells, and before the dawn I heard the cocks crow on Kemmel Hill. I saw the seventeen mines go up, and earth and flame gush out of them, as though the fires of hell had risen. A terrible sight! as the work of men against their fellow creatures. It was the signal for seven hundred and fifty of our heavy guns and two thousand of our field guns to open fire, and behind a moving wall of bursting shells, English, Irish, and New Zealand soldiers moved forward in dense waves. It was almost a walkover. Only here and there groups of Germans served their machine guns to the death. Most of the living were stupefied amid their dead, in the upheaved trenches, slashed woods, and deepest dugouts. I walked to the edge of the mine craters and stared into their great gulfs, wondering how many German bodies had been engulfed there. The following day I walked through Wutschett the Wood to the ruins of the hospice on the ridge. In 1914 some of our cavalry had passed this way when the hospice was a big red brick building with wings and outhouses and a large community of nuns and children. Through my glasses I had often seen its ruins from Kemmel Hill and the Scherpenberg. Now nothing was left but a pile of broken bricks, not very high. Our losses were comparatively small, though some brave men had died, including Major Willie Redmond, whose death in Wichita the Wood was heard with grief in Ireland. Ludendorff admits the severity of the blow. Quotes, the moral effect of the explosions was simply staggering. The 7th of June cost us dear, and owing to the success of the enemy attack, the price we paid was very heavy. Here, too, it was many days before the front was again secure. The British Army did not press its advantage. Apparently, it only intended to improve its position for the launching of the Great Flanders Offensive. It thereupon resumed operations between the old Arras battlefield and also between La Bessie and Lens. The object of the enemy was to wear us down and distract our attention from Ypres. End of quotes. That was true. The Canadians made heavy attacks at Lens, then, some of which I saw from ground beyond Notre Dame de Lorette and the Vimy Ridge and the enemy country by Grenay when those men besieged a long chain of mining villages which girdled lawns itself, where every house was a machine-gun fort with deep tunnels. I saw them after desperate struggles, covered in clay, parched with thirst, gassed, wounded, but indomitable. Lawns was the Troy of the Canadian Corps and the English troops of the First Army, and it was only owing to other battles they were called upon to fight in Flanders that they had to leave it last uncaptured for the enemy to escape all of this was subsidiary to the great offensive in flanders with its ambitious objects but when the battles of flanders began the year was getting past its middle age 
and events on other fronts had upset the strategical plan of sir douglas haig and our high command the failure and abandonment of the neville offensive in the champagne were disastrous to us it liberated many german divisions who could be sent up to relieve exhausted divisions in flanders instead of attacking the enemy when he was weakening under assaults elsewhere we attacked him when all was quiet on the french front the collapse of russia was now happening and our policy ought to have been to save men for the tremendous moment of nineteen eighteen when we should need all our strength so it seems certain now though it was easy to prophesy after the event i went along the coast as far as coxid and newport and saw secret preparations for the coast offensive we were building enormous gun emplacements at mellow bon for long-range naval guns camouflaged in sand dunes our men were being trained for fighting in the dunes our artillery positions were mapped out three shots to one sir said sir henry rawlinson to the king that's the stuff to give them but the germans struck the first blow up there not of importance to the strategical position but ghastly to two battalions of the first division cut off on a spit of land at lombardsed and almost annihilated under a fury of fire at this time the enemy was developing his use of a new poison gas mustard gas which raised blisters and burned men's bodies where the vapor was condensed into reddish powder and blinded them for a week or more if not forever and turned their lungs to water i saw hundreds of these cases in the third canadian casualty clearing station on the coast and there were thousands all along our front at Ostonkirk, near Newport, I had a whiff of it and was conscious of a burning sensation about the lips and eyelids, and for a week afterward vomited at times, and was scared by queer flutterings of the heart, which at night seemed to have but a feeble beat. It was enough to put the wind up. Our men dreaded the new danger, so mysterious, so stealthy in its approach. It was one of the new plagues of war. Chapter 5 the Battle of Flanders began around Ypres on July 31st, with a greater intensity of artillery on our side than had ever been seen before in this war, in spite of the Somme and Messines, when on big days of battle 2,000 guns opened fire on a single corps front. The enemy was strong also in artillery arranged in great groups, often shifting to enfilade our lines of attack. The natural strength of his position along the ridges which were like a great bony hand outstretched through Flanders, with streams or beaks, as they are called, flowing in the valleys which ran between the fingers of that claw-like range, were strengthened by chains of little concrete forts or pillboxes, as our soldiers called them, so arranged that they could defend one another by enfilade machine-gun fire. These were held by garrisons of machine-gunners of proved resolution, whose duty was to break up our waves of attack until, even if successful in gaining ground, only small bodies of survivors would be in a position to resist the counter-attacks launched by German divisions farther back. The strength of pillboxes made of concrete two inches thick resisted everything but the direct hit of heavy shells, and they were not easy targets at long range. The garrisons within them fought with the utmost courage, even when surrounded, and again and again this method of defense proved terribly effective against the desperate, heroic assaults of British infantry. What our men had suffered in earlier battles was surpassed by what they now were called upon to endure. All the agonies of war, which I have attempted to describe, were piled up in those fields of Flanders. There was nothing missing in the list of war's abominations. A few days after the battle began, the rains began and hardly ceased for four months night after night the skies opened and let down steady torrents which turned all that country into one great bog of slime those little rivers or beaks which ran between the knobby fingers of the claw-like range of ridges were blown out of their channels and slopped over into broad swamps the hurricanes of artillery fire which our gunners poured upon the enemy positions for twenty miles in depth turned up deep shell craters which intermingled and made pits which the rains and floods filled to the brim the only way of walking was by duck boards 
tracks laid down across the bogs under enemy fire, smashed up day by day, laid down again under the cover of darkness. Along a duckboard walk, men must march in a single file, and if one of our men, heavily laden in his fighting kit, stumbled on those greasy boards, as all of them stumbled at every few yards, and fell off, he sank up to his knees, often up to his waist, sometimes up to his neck, in mud and water. If he were wounded when he fell, and darkness was about him, he could only cry to God or his pals, for he was helpless otherwise. One of our divisions of Lancashire men, the 66th, took eleven hours in making three miles or so out of Ypres across that ground on their way to attack, and then, in spite of their exhaustion, attacked. Yet, week after week, month after month, our masses of men, almost every division of the British Army at one time or another, struggled on through the sloth of despond, capturing ridge after ridge, until the heights of Passchendaele were stormed and won, even though then the Germans clung to Staden and Westrusbeke, when all our efforts came to a dead halt, and that Belgian coast attack was never launched. Sir Douglas Haig thinks that some of the descriptions of that six months' horror were exaggerated. As a man who knows something of the value of words, and who saw many of those battle scenes in Flanders, and went out from Ypres many times during those months to the West Hook Ridge and Pilkham Ridge, and Friendsburg, and Inverness Copse, and Glencourse Wood, and beyond to Polygon Wood and Passchendaele, where his dead lay in the swamps and round the pillboxes, and where tanks that had wallowed into the mire were shot into scrap heap by German gunfire, thirty were knocked out by direct hits on the first day of battle, and where our own guns were being flung up by the harassing fire of heavy shells, I say now that nothing that has been written is more than pale image of the abomination of those battlefields, and that no pen or brush has yet achieved the picture of that Armageddon in which so many of our men perished. They were months of ghastly endurance to gunners when batteries sank up to their axles, as I saw them often, while they fired almost unceasingly for days and nights without sleep, and were living targets of shells which burst about them. They were months of battle in which our men advanced through slime into slime, under the slash of machine-gun bullets, shrapnel, and high explosives, wet to the skin, chilled to the bone, plastered up to the eyes in mud, with the dreadful way back for walking wounded, and but little chance sometimes for wounded who could not walk. The losses in many of these battles amounted almost to annihilation to many battalions, and whole divisions lost as much as fifty per cent of their strength after a few days in action, before they were relieved. Those were dreadful losses. Napoleon said that no body of men could lose more than 25% of their fighting strength in an action without being broken in spirit. Our men lost double that, and more than double, but kept their courage, though in some cases they lost their hope. The 55th Division of Lancashire men, in their attacks on a line of pillboxes called Plum Farm, Schuler Farm, and Square Farm below the Gravenstaffel Spur, lost 3,840 men in casualties out of 6,049. Those were not uncommon losses. They were usual losses. One day's fighting in Flanders on October 4th cost the British Army 10,000 casualties, and they were considered light by the higher command in relation to the objects achieved. General Harper of the 51st Highland Division told me that, in his opinion, the official communiques and the war correspondence articles gave only one side of the picture of war and were too glowing in their optimism. I did not tell him that my articles were accused of being black in pessimism, pervading gloom. We tell the public, he said, that an enemy division has been shattered. That is true, but so is mine. One of my brigades has lost 87 officers and 2,000 men since the spring. He protested that there was not enough liaison between the fighting officers and the higher command, and could not blame them for their hatred of the staff. The story of the two Irish divisions, the 36th Ulster and 16th Nationalist, in their fighting on August 16th, is black in tragedy. They were left in the line for 16 days before the battle and were shelled and gassed incessantly as they crouched in wet ditches. 
Every day groups of men were blown to bits until the ditches were bloody and the living lay by the corpses of their comrades. Every day scores of wounded crawled back through the bogs if they had the strength to crawl. Before the attack on August 16th, the Ulster Division had lost nearly 2,000 men. They then attacked and lost 2,000 more, and over 100 officers. The 16th Division lost as many men before the attack and more officers. The 8th Dublins had been annihilated in the holding line. On the night before the battle, hundreds of men were gassed. Then their comrades attacked and lost over 2,000 more and 162 officers. All the ground below two knolls of earth, called Hill 35 and Hill 37, which were defended by German pillboxes called Pond Farm and Gallipoli, Beck House and Bory Farm, became an Irish shambles. In spite of their dreadful losses, the survivors in the Irish battalion went forward to the assault with desperate valor on the morning of August 16th, surrounded the pillboxes, stormed them through blasts of machine-gun fire, and toward the end of the day small bodies of these men had gained a footing on the objectives which they had been asked to capture, but were then too weak to resist German counter-attacks. The 7th and 8th Royal Irish Fusiliers had been almost exterminated in their efforts to dislodge the enemy from Hill 37. They lost 17 officers out of 21, and 64 percent of their men. One company of four officers and 100 men ordered to capture the concrete fort known as Bory Farm at all cost, lost four officers and 70 men. The Ninth Dublins lost 15 officers out of 17 and 66 percent of their men. The two Irish divisions were broken to bits, and their brigadiers called it murder. They were violent in their denunciation of the Fifth Army for having put their men into the attack after those thirteen days of heavy shelling, and after the battle they complained that they were cast aside like old shoes, no care being taken for the comfort of the men who had survived. No motor lorries were sent to meet them and bring them down, but they had to tramp back, exhausted and dazed. The remnants of the 16th Division, the poor, despairing remnants, were sent, without a rest or baths, straight into the line again down south. I found a general opinion among officers and men, not only of the Irish Division, under the command of the Fifth Army, that they had been the victims of atrocious staff work, tragic in its consequences. From what I saw of some of the Fifth Army staff officers, I was of the same opinion. Some of these young gentlemen, and some of the elderly officers, were arrogant and supercilious, without revealing any symptoms of intelligence. If they had wisdom, it was deeply camouflaged by an air of inefficiency. If they had knowledge, they hid it as a secret of their own. General Goff, commanding the Fifth Army in Flanders, and afterward north and south of St. Quentin, where the enemy broke through, was extremely courteous, of most amiable character, with a high sense of duty. But in Flanders, if not personally responsible for many tragic happenings, he was badly served by some of his subordinates, and battalion officers and divisional staffs raged against the whole of the Fifth Army organization, or lack of organization, with an extreme passion of speech. "'You must be glad to leave Flanders,' I said to a group of officers, trekking toward the Cambrai salient. One of them answered violently, "'God be thanked we are leaving the Fifth Army area!' In an earlier chapter of this book, I have already paid a tribute to the Second Army, and especially to Sir John Harrington, his chief of staff. There was a thoroughness of method, a minute attention to detail, a care for the comfort and spirit of the men throughout the Second Army staff, which did at least inspire the troops with the belief that whatever they did in the fighting lines had been prepared and would be supported with every possible help that organization could provide. That belief was founded not upon fine words spoken on parade, but by strenuous work, a driving zeal, and a fine intelligence of a chief of staff whose brain was like a high-power engine. I remember a historic little scene in the Second Army headquarters at Cassel, in a room where many of the great battles had been planned, when Sir John Harrington made the dramatic announcement that Sir Herbert Plummer and he, as General Plummer's chief of staff, had been ordered to Italy in the middle of a battle to report on the situation which had become so grave there. He expressed his regret that he should have to leave Flanders without completing all his plans, 
but was glad that Passchendaele had been captured before his going. In front of him was the map of the great range from Witschede to Staden, and he laid his hands upon it and smiled and said, I often used to think how much of that range we should get this year. Now it is nearly all ours. He thanked the war correspondents for all their articles, which had been very helpful to the army, and said how glad he had been to have our cooperation. It was my ambition, he said, speaking with some emotion, to make cordial relations between battalion officers and the staff, and to get rid of that criticism, sometimes just, which has been directed against the staff. The Second Army has been able to show the fighting soldiers that the success of a battle depends greatly on efficient staff work, and has inspired them with confidence in the preparations and organization behind the lines. Yet it seemed to me in my pessimism, and seems to me still in my memory of all that ghastly fighting, that the fine mechanism of the Second Army applied to those battles in Flanders was utterly misspent, that after the first heavy rains had fallen the offensive ought to have been abandoned, and that it was a frightful error of judgment to ask masses of men to attack in conditions where they had not a dog's chance of victory, except at a cost which made it of pyrrhic irony. Nevertheless, it was wearing the enemy out, as well as our own strength and manpower. He could less afford to lose his one man than we could our three, now that the United States had entered the war. Ludendorff has described the German agony and days of battle which he calls terrific, inflicting enormous loss upon his armies and increasing his anxiety at the reduction of our fighting strength. Quotes, Enormous masses of ammunition, the like of which no mortal mind before the war had conceived, were hurled against human beings who lay, eking out by a bare existence, scattered in shell holes that were deep in slime. The terror of it surpassed even that of the shell-pitted field before Verdun. This was not life. It was agony unspeakable, and out of the universe of slime the attacker wallowed forward, slowly but continually, and in dense masses. Time and again the enemy struck by the hail of our projectiles in the forefield collapsed, and our lonely men in the shell holes breathed again. Then the mass came on. Rifle and machine gun were beslimed. The struggle was man to man, and only too often it was the mass that won. What the German soldier accomplished, lived through, and suffered during the Flanders battle will stand in his honor for all time as a brazen monument that he set himself with his own hands on enemy soil. The enemy's losses, too, were heavy. When, in the spring of 1918, we occupied the battlefield, it presented a horrible spectacle with its many unburied dead. Their number ran into thousands. Two-thirds of them were enemy dead. One-third were German soldiers who had met there a hero's death. And yet the truth must be told. Individual units no longer surmounted as before the demoralizing influences of the defensive campaign. October 26th and 30th and November 6th and 10th were also days of pitched battle of the heaviest kind. The enemy stormed like a wild bull against the iron wall that had kept him at a distance from our U-boat base. He hurled his weight against the Hothholst wood. He hurled it against Pulzelkapel, Passchendaele, Leclerc, Gebevelt, Zandvoorde. At very many points he dented the line. It seemed as if he would charge down the wall, but although a slight tremor passed through its foundation, the wall held. The impressions that I continued to receive were extremely grave. Tactically, everything had been done. The forefield was good. Our artillery practice had materially improved. Behind nearly every fighting division there stood a second, as rear wave. In the third line, too, there were still reserves. We knew that the wear and tear of the enemy's forces was high, but we also knew that the enemy was extraordinarily strong, and what was equally important, possessed extraordinary willpower. End of quotes. That was the impression of the cold brain directing the machinery of war from German headquarters. More human and more tragic is a letter of an unknown German officer, which we found, among hundreds of others, telling the same tale in the mud of the battlefield. Quotes, if it were not for the men who have been spared me on this fierce day and are lying around me and looking timidly at me, 
I should shed hot and bitter tears over the terrors that have menaced me during these hours. On the morning of September 18th, my dugout containing 17 men was shot to pieces over our heads. I am the only one who withstood the maddening bombardment of three days and still survives. You cannot imagine the frightful mental torments I have undergone in those few hours. After crawling out through the bleeding remnants of my comrades and through the smoke and debris, wandering and running in the midst of the raging gunfire in search of a refuge, I am now awaiting death at any moment. You do not know what Flanders means. Flanders means endless human endurance. Flanders means blood and scraps of human bodies. Flanders means heroic courage and faithfulness even unto death. End of quotes. To British and to Germans, it meant the same. End of section 20. Section 21 of Now It Can Be Told by Philip Gibbs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 7, Chapters 6 to 10. Chapter 6. During the four and a half months of that fighting, the war correspondents were billeted in the old town of Cassel, where, perched on a hill which overlooks a wide stretch of Flanders, through our glasses we could see the sand dunes beyond Dunkirk, and with the naked eye the whole vista of the battle line around Ypres, and in the wide curve all the countryside lying between Air and Hasenbroek and Notre Dame de Lorette. My billet was in a monastery for old priests on the eastern edge of the town, and at night my window was lighted by distant shell fire, and I gazed out to a sky of darkness rent by vivid flashes, bursts of red flame, and rockets rising high. The priests used to tap on my door when I came back from the battlefields all muddy, with a slime-plastered face, writing furiously, and an old padre used to plague me like that, saying, What news? It goes well, eh? Not too well, perhaps? Alas, it is slaughter on both sides. It's all your fault, I said once, chaffingly, to get rid of him. You do not pray enough. He grasped my wrist with his skinny old hand. Monsieur, he whispered, after eighty years i nearly lose my faith in god that is terrible is it not why does not god give us victory alas perhaps we have sinned too much one needed great faith for courage then and my courage never much to boast about ebbed low those days when i agonized over our losses and saw the suffering of our men and those foul swamps where the bodies of our boys lay in pools of slime vividly colored by the metallic vapors of high explosives beside the gashed tree stumps and the mangled corpses of germans who had died outside their pill boxes and when i saw dead horses on the roads out of yeep and transport drivers dead beside their broken wagons and officers of ours with the look of doomed men nerve-shaken soul-stricken in captured blockhouses where i took a nip of whiskey with them now and then before they attacked again and groups of dazed prisoners coming down the tracks through their own harrowing fire, and always, always streams of wounded by tens of thousands. There was an old mill-house near Vlamantinga, beyond Goldfish Chateau, which was made into a casualty clearing station, and scores of times when I saw it, I saw it crowded with the walking wounded who had trudged down from the fighting line, taking eleven hours, fourteen hours sometimes, to get so far. They were no longer cheerful like the gay lads who came lightly wounded out of the earlier battles, glad of life, excited by their luck. They were silent, shivering, stricken men, boys in age, but old and weary in the knowledge of war. The slime of the battlefields had engulfed them. Their clothes were plastered to their bodies. Their faces and hands were coated with that whitish clay. Their steel hats and rifles were caked with it. Their eyes, brooding, were strangely alive in those corpse-like figures of mud who huddled round charcoal stoves or sat motionless on wooden forms waiting for ambulances. Yet they were stark in spirit still. Only the mud beat us, they said. Man after man said that. We should have gone much farther except for the mud. 
Along the Menin Road there were wayside dressing stations for wounded, with surgeons at work, and I saw the same scenes there. They were not beyond the danger zone. Doctors and orderlies were killed by long-range shells. Wounded were wounded again or finished off. Some ambulances were blown to bits. A colonel who had been standing in talk with a doctor was killed halfway through a sentence. There was never a day in which Ypres was not shelled by long-range high velocities which came howling overhead as I heard them scores of times in passing through those ruins with gas mask at the alert, according to orders, and steel hat strapped on, and a deadly sense of nostalgia because of what was happening in the fields of horror that lay beyond. Yet to the soldier farther up the Menin Road, Ypres was sanctuary and God's heaven. The little old town of Cassel on the hill, where once a Duke of York marched up and then marched down again, was beyond shell range, though the enemy tried to reach it and dropped twelve-inch shells, which made holes deep enough to bury a coach and horses, round its base. There is an inn there, the Hotel du Sauvage, which belongs now to English history and Scottish and Irish and Welsh and Australian and Canadian. It was the last place along the road to Ypres, where men who loved life could get a dinner sitting with their knees below a tablecloth, with candlelight glinting in glasses, while outside the windows the flickering fires of death told them how short might be their tarrying in the good places of the world. This was a good place, where the blinds were pulled down by Madame, who understood. Behind the desk was Mademoiselle Suzanne, a dainty rogue in porcelain, with wonderfully bright eyes, and just a little greeting of a smile for any young officer who looked her way trying to get that greeting, because it was ever so long since he had seen a pretty face, and might be ever so long again. Sometimes it was a smile met in a mirror against the wall, to which Suzanne looked to touch her curls and see, like the Lady of Shalott, the pictures of life that passed. A man would tilt his chair to get that angle of vision. Outside on these nights of war, it was often blusterous, very dark, wet with heavy rain. The door opened, and other officers came in with waterproofs sagging round their legs and top boots muddy to the tags, abashed because they made pools of water on polished boards. Pardon, madame. Ce ne fait rien, monsieur. There was a clip-clop of horses' hoofs in the yard. I thought of D'Artagnan and the musketeers who might have ridden into this very yard, strode into this very room, on their way to Dunkirk or Calais. Madame played the piano remarkably well, classical music of all kinds, and any accompaniment to any song. Our young officers sang. Some of them touched the piano with a loving touch and said, Ye gods, a piano again, and played old melodies or merry ragtime. Before Passchendaele was taken, a Canadian boy brought a fiddle with him, and played last of all, after other tunes, the long, long trail, which his comrades sang. "'Come and play to us again,' said Madame. "'If I come back,' said the boy. He did not come back along the road through Ypres to Cassel. From the balcony one could see the night birds fly. On every moonlight night, German raiders were about bombing our camps and villages. One could see just below the hill how the bombs crashed into Saint-Marie-Capelle, and many hamlets where British soldiers lay, and where peasants and children were killed with them. For some strange reason, Cassel itself was never bombed. "'We are a nest of spies,' said some of the inhabitants. But others had faith in a miraculous statue, and still others in Sir Herbert Plummer. Once, when a big shell burst very close, I looked at Mademoiselle Suzanne behind the desk. She did not show fear by the flicker of an eyelid, though officers in the room were startled. Vous n'avez pas peur même de la mort? You are not afraid even of death? I asked. She shrugged her shoulders. J'aime bien fiche de la mort. I don't care a damn for death. The Hotel du Sauvage was a pleasant rendezvous but barred for a time to young gentlemen of the Air Force who lingered too long there sometimes and were noisy. It was barred to all officers for certain hours of the day without special permits from the APM, who made trouble in granting them. Three Scottish officers rode down into Cassell. They had ridden down from Hellfire to sit at a table covered with a tablecloth and drink tea in a room again. 
they were refused permission, and their language to me about the APM was unprintable. They desired his blood and bones. They raised their hands to heaven to send down wrath upon all skunks dwelling behind the lines in luxury and denying any kind of comfort to fighting men. They included the PM in their rage, and all staff officers from Cassell to Bologna, and away back to Whitehall. To cheer up the war correspondent's mess, we assembled at night after miserable days, and when in the darkness gusts of wind and rain clouded the window panes, and distant gunfire rumbled, or bombs were falling in near villages, telling of peasant girls killed in their beds and soldiers mangled in wayside burns, we had the company sometimes of an officer, a black-eyed fellow, who told merry little tales of executions and prison happenings at which he assisted in the course of his duty. I remember one about a young officer sentenced to death for cowardice. There were quite a number of lads like that. He was blindfolded by a gas mask fixed on the wrong way round, and pinioned and tied to a post. The firing party lost their nerve, and their shots were wild. The boy was only wounded, and screamed at his mask, and the APM had to shoot him twice with his revolver before he died. That was only one of many little anecdotes told by a gentleman who seemed to like his job, and to enjoy these reminiscences. The battles of Flanders ended with the capture of Passchendaele by the Canadians, and that year's fighting on the Western Front cost us 800,000 casualties, and though we had dealt the enemy heavy blows from which he reeled back, the drain upon our manpower was too great for what was to happen next year, and our men were too sorely tired. For the first time the British Army lost its spirit of optimism, and there was a sense of deadly depression among many officers and men with whom I came in touch. They saw no ending of the war, and nothing except continuous slaughter, such as that in Flanders. Our men were not mythical heroes exalted by the gods above the limitations of nature. They were human beings with wives and children or mothers and sisters whom they desired to see again. They hated this war. Death had no allurement for them except now and then as an escape from intolerable life under fire. They would have been superhuman if they had not revolted in spirit, though still faithful to discipline against the foul conditions of warfare in the swamps where, in spite of all they had, in that four months or so of fighting, achieved the greatest effort of human courage and endurance ever done by masses of men in obedience to command. Chapter 7 At the end of those battles happened that surprising, audacious adventure in the Cambrai salient, organized by the Third Army under General Bing, when on November 20th, 1917, squadrons of tanks broke through the Hindenburg line, and infantry streamed through the breach captured hundreds of guns, 10,000 prisoners, many villages and ridges, and gave a monstrous shock to the German high command. The audacity of the adventure lay in the poverty of manpower with which it was attempted and supported. The divisions engaged had all been through the grinding mill of Flanders and were tired men. The artillery was made up largely of those batteries which had been axle-deep in Flanders mud, it was clearly understood by General Bing and General Louis Vaughan, his chief of staff, that Sir Douglas Haig could not afford to give them strong reserves to exploit any success they might gain by surprise or to defend the captured ground against certain counterattacks. It was to be a surprise assault by tanks and infantry, with the hope that the cavalry corps might find its gap at last and sweep round Cambrai before the enemy could recover and reorganize. With other correspondents, I saw General Louis Vaughan, who expounded the scheme before it was launched. That charming man, with his professional manner, sweetness of speech, gentleness of voice and gesture, like an Oxford don, analyzing the war correspondence of Xenophon, made no secret of the economy with which the operation would have to be made. We must cut our cost according to our cloth, he said. The whole idea was to seize only as much ground as the initial success could gain, and not to press if resistance became strong. It was a gamble with a chance of luck. The cavalry might do nothing or score a big triumph. All depended on the surprise of the tanks. If they were discovered before the assault, the whole adventure would fail at the start. 
They had been brought up secretly by night, 400 of them, with supply tanks for ammunition and petrol lying hidden in woods by day. So the artillery and infantry and cavalry had been concentrated also. The enemy believed himself secure in its Hindenburg line, which had been constructed behind broad hedges of barbed wire with such wide ditches that no tank could cross. How, then, would tanks cross? Ah, that was a little trick which would surprise the Germans mightily. Each tank would advance through the early morning mists with a bridge on its nose. The bridge was really a big fascine, or bundle of faggots, about a yard and a half in diameter, and controlled by a lever and chain from the interior of the tank. Having plowed through the barbed wire and reached the edge of the Hindenburg Trench, the tank would drop the fascine into the center of the ditch, stretch out its long body, reach the bundle of faggots, find support on it, and use it as a stepping stone to the other side. Very simple in idea and effect. So it happened, and the mists favored us, as I saw on the morning of the attack at a little place called Beaumont, near villers Puche. The enemy was completely surprised, caught at breakfast in his dugouts, rounded up in batches. The tanks went through the breach they had made, with the infantry swarming round them and captured Havincourt, Hermes, Ribicourt, Gouzoncourt, Messiner, and Marcon, and a wide stretch of country forming a cup of amphitheater below a series of low ridges south of Boulogne Wood, where the ground rose again. It was a spectacular battle, such as we had never seen before, and during the following days, when our troops worked up to Boulogne Wood and through the intervening villages of Anneau, Grand Court, Contang, and Fontaine Notre Dame, I saw tanks going into action and cruising about like land ships with cavalry patrols riding over open ground, airplanes flying low over German territory, and masses of infantry beyond all trench lines and streams of liberated civilians trudging through the lines from Marquing. The enemy was demoralized the first day and made only slight resistance. The chief losses of the tanks were due to a German major of artillery who served his own guns and knocked out a baker's dozen of these monsters as they crawled over Flickcare Ridge. I saw them lying there with the blood and bones of their pilots and crews within their steel walls. It was a Highland soldier who checked the German major. You're a brave man, he said, but you've got to die, and ran him through the stomach with his bayonet. It was this check at the Flickcare Ridge followed by the breaking of the bridge at Mesnier, under the weight of a tank and the holding of a trench line called the Rumilly Switch by a battalion of Germans who raced to it from Cambrai before our men could capture it, which thwarted the plans of the cavalry. Our cavalry generals were in a consultation at their headquarters too far back to take immediate advantage of the situation. They waited for the capture of the Rumilly Switch and held up masses of cavalrymen whom I saw riding through the village of Ribicourt, with excitement and exultation, because they thought that at last their chance had come. Finally, orders were given to cancel all previous plans to advance. Only one squadron, belonging to the Canadian Fort Garry Horse and General Seeley's division, failed to receive the order. Their colonel rode after them, but his horse slipped and fell before he caught them up and it was their day of heroic folly. They rode fast and made their way through a gap in the wire cut by the troopers and came under rifle and machine-gun fire, which wounded the captain and several men. The command was carried on by a young lieutenant, who rode with his men until they reached the camouflage road southeast of the village of Rumini, where they went through in sections under fire of the enemy hidden in the banks. Here they came up against a battery of field guns, one of which fired point-blank at them. They charged the battery, putting the guns out of action and killing some of the gunners. Those who were not destroyed surrendered, and the prisoners were left to be sent back by the supports. The squadron then dealt with the German infantry in the neighborhood. Some of them fled, while some were killed or surrendered. All these operations were done at a gallop under fire from flanking blockhouses. The squadron then slowed down to a walk and took up a position in a sunken road one kilometer east of Rumilly. Darkness crept down upon them, and gradually they were surrounded by German infantry and machine guns, so that they were in a great danger of capture or destruction. Only five of their horses remained unhit, and the lieutenant in command decided that they must endeavor to cut their way through and get back. 
the horses were stampeded in the direction of the enemy in order to draw the machine-gun fire and while these riderless horses galloped wildly out of one end of the sunken road the officer and his surviving troopers escaped from the other end on the way back they encountered four bodies of the enemy whom they attacked and routed on one occasion their escape was due to the cunning of another young lieutenant who spoke german and held conversations with the enemy in the darkness deceiving them as to the identity of his force until they were able to take the german troops by surprise and hack a way through this lieutenant was hit in the face by a bullet and when he arrived back in masnieres with his men in advance of the rear guard he was only able to make his report before falling in a state of collapse other small bodies of cavalry among them the eighth dragoons and fifth hussars had wild heroic adventures in the cambrai salient where they rode under blasts of machine-gun fire and rounded up prisoners in the ruined villages of nouvelle and fontaine notre dame some of them went into foley wood near by and met seven german officers strolling about the glades as though there was no war on they took them prisoners but had to release some of them later as they could not be bothered with them later they came across six ammunition wagons and destroyed them in the heart of the wood was one of the german divisional headquarters and one of our cavalry officers dismounted and approached the cottage stealthily and looked through the windows inside was a party of german officers seated at a table with beer mugs in front of them apparently unconscious of any danger near them our officer fired his revolver through the windows and then like a schoolboy who has thrown a stone ran away as hard as he could and joined his troop youthful folly of gallant hearts after the enemy's surprise his resistance stiffened and he held the village of fontaine notre dame and boulogne wood on the hill above with strong rear guards very quickly too he brought new batteries into action and things became unpleasant in fields and villages where our men as i saw them on those days hunted around for souvenirs in german dugouts and found field glasses automatic pistols and other good booty it seemed to me that the plan as outlined by general louis vaughan not to exploit success farther than justified by the initial surprise was abandoned for a time a brigade of guards was put in to attack fontaine notre dame and suffered heavily from machine-gun fire before taking it the sixty-second yorkshire division lost many good men in boulogne village and boulogne wood into which the enemy poured gas shells and high explosives then on november thirtieth the germans under the direction of general von marwitz came back upon us with a tiger's pounce in a surprise attack which we ought to have anticipated i happened to be on the way to gozoncourt early that morning and going through the village of fan next to it i saw men straggling back in some disorder and gun teams wedged in a dense traffic moving in what seemed to be the wrong direction i don't know what to do said a young gunner officer my battery has been captured and i can't get into touch with the brigade what has happened i asked he looked at me in surprise don't you know the enemy has broken through broken through where the gunner officer pointed down the road at the present moment he's in gozancourt i went northward and saw that places like hermes and heverencourt which had been peaceful spots for a few days were under heavy fire bourlon wood beyond was a fiery furnace hell had broken out again and things looked bad there was a general packing up of dumps and field hospitals and heavy batteries in gozancourt and other places our divisional and brigade headquarters were caught napping officers went in their pajamas or in their baths when they heard the snap of machine-gun bullets i saw the guards go forward to gozoncourt for a counter-attack they came along munching apples and whistling as though on peace maneuvers next day after they had gained back gozoncourt i saw many of them wounded lying under tarpaulins all dirty and bloody the germans had adopted our own way of attack they had assembled masses of troops secretly moving them forward by night under the cover of woods so that our air scouts saw no movement by day our line was weakly held along the front the fifty fifth division thinned out by losses was holding the line of thirteen hundred yards three times as much as any troops can hold in safety and the german storm troops after a short terrific bombardment broke through to a distance of five miles our tired men who had gained the first victory 
fought heroic rearguard actions back from Mesnier and Marcoing, and back from Boulogne Wood on the northern side of the salient. They made the enemy pay a high price in blood for the success of his counterattack, but we lost many thousands of brave fellows, and the joy bells which had rung in London on November 20th became sad and ironical music in the hearts of our disappointed people. So ended 1917, our black year, and in the spring of 1918, after all the losses of that year, our armies on the Western Front were threatened by the greatest menace that had ever drawn near to them, and the British Empire was in jeopardy. Chapter 8 In the autumn of 1917, the Italian disaster of Caporetto had happened, and Sir Herbert Plummer, with his chief of staff, Sir John Harrington, and many staff officers of the Second Army had, as I have told, been sent to Italy with some of our best divisions, so weakening Sir Douglas Haig's command. At that very time, also, after the bloody losses in Flanders, the French government and general headquarters brought severe pressure upon the British War Council to take over a greater length of line in France, in order to release some of the older classes of the French army who had been under arms since 1914. We yielded to that pressure, and Sir Douglas Haig extended his lines north and south of St. Quentin, where the Fifth Army, under General Go, was entrusted with the defense. I went over all that new ground of ours, out of Noyon to Cholny and Berisi, and the floods of the Bois-Bailafer, out from Ham to Holmont Forest and Francilly, Pain du Doulon, and the Fort de Lays by Saint Quentin, and from Perron to Hagicourt and Jeancourt and La Verrier. It was a pleasant country, with living trees and green fields not annihilated by shell fire though with the naked eye I could see the scarred walls of St. Quentin Cathedral, and the villages near the front lines had been damaged in the usual way. It was dead quiet there for miles, except for short bursts of harassing fire now and then, and odd shells here and there, and bursts of black shrapnel in the blue sky of mild days. Paradise after Flanders, said our men, but I knew that there was a great movement of troops westward from Russia, and wondered how long this paradise would last. I looked about for trench systems, support lines, and did not see them, and wondered what our defense would be if the enemy attacked here in great strength. Our army seemed wonderfully thinned out. There were few men to be seen in our outpost line or in reserve. It was all strangely quiet, alarmingly quiet. Yet pleasant for the time being. I had a brother commanding a battery along the railway line south of San Quentin. I went to see him, and we had a picnic meal on a little hill, staring straight toward San Quentin Cathedral. One of his junior officers set the gramophone going. The colonel of the artillery brigade came jogging up on his horse and called out, Fine morning, and a pretty spot. The infantry divisions were cheerful. Like a rest cure, they said. They had sports almost within sight of the German lines. I saw a boxing match in an Irish battalion, and while two fellows hammered each other, I glanced away from them to winding, wavy lines of chalk on the opposite hillsides, and wondered what was happening behind them in that quietude. "'What do you think about the German offensive?' I asked a general of a London division, General Gorringe, of the 47th, standing on a wagon and watching a tug-of-war. From that place also we could see the German positions. GHQ has got the wind up, he said. It is all bluff. General Hall, temporarily commanding the Irish division, was of the same opinion, and took some pains to explain the folly of thinking the Germans would attack. Yet day after day, week after week, the intelligence reports were full of evidence of immense movements of troops westward, of intensive training of German divisions in back areas of new hospitals, ammunition dumps, airplanes, battery positions. There was overwhelming evidence as to the enemy's intentions. Intelligence officers took me on one side and said, England ought to know. The people ought to be prepared. All this is very serious. We shall be up against it. GHQ was convinced. 
On February 23rd, the war correspondents published articles summarizing the evidence, pointing out the gravity of the menace, and they were passed by the censorship. But England was not scared. Dances were in full swing in London. Little ladies laughed as usual, light-hearted. Flanders had made no difference to national optimism, though the hospitals were crowded with blind and maimed and shell-shocked. "'I am skeptical of the German offensive,' said Mr. Bonar Law. Nobody believed the war correspondents. Nobody ever did believe us, though some of us wrote the truth, from first to last, as far as the facts of war go, apart from deeper psychology, and a naked realism of horrors and losses, and criticism of facts which did not come within our liberty of the pen. They were strange months for me. I felt that I was in possession, as indeed I was, of a terrible secret which might lead to the ending of the world, our world as we knew it, with our liberties and power. For weeks I had been pledged to say no word about it, to write not a word about it, and it was like being haunted by a specter all day long. One laughed, but the specter echoed one's laughter and said, Wait. The mild sunshine of those spring days was pleasant to one's spirit in the woods about Le Ferre, and in fields where machine-guns chattered a little, while overhead our airplanes dodged German archies. But the specter chilled one's blood at the reminder of vast masses of field-gray men drawing nearer to our lines in overwhelming numbers. I motored to many parts of the front, and my companion sometimes was a little Frenchman who had lost a leg in the war, d'Artagnan with a wooden peg, most valiant, most gay. Along the way he recited the poems of Bonsard. At the journey's end one day he sang old French chansons in an English mess, within gunshot of the German lines. He climbed up a tree and gazed at the German positions and made sketches while he hummed little tunes and said between them, Ah, les sacre boches, if only I could fight again. I remember a pleasant dinner in the old town of Noyon, in a little restaurant where two pretty girls waited. They had come from Paris with their parents to start this business, now that Noyon was safe. Safe, oh Lord! And everything was very dainty and clean. At dinner that night there was a hostile air raid overhead. Bombs crashed, but the girls were brave. One of them volunteered to go with an officer across the square to show him the way to the APM, from where he had to get a pass to stay for dinner. Shrapnel bullets were whipping the flagstones of the Grand Place from anti-aircraft guns. The officer wore his steel helmet. The girl was going without any hat above her braided hair. He did not let her go, and the officer had another guide. One night I brought my brother to the place from his battery near San Quentin. We dined well slept well. Noyon is a good spot, he said. I shall come here again when you give me a lift. A few days later my brother was firing at masses of Germans with open sights, and the British army was in a full tide of retreat, and the junior officer who had played his gramophone was dead with other officers and men of that battery. When I next passed through Noyon, shells were falling into it, and later I saw it in ruins, with the glory of the Romanesque cathedral sadly scarred. I have oft times wondered what happened to the little family in the old hotel. So March 21st came, as we knew it would come, even to the very date, and Ludendorff played his trump cards and the great game. Before that date I had an interview with General Goh, commanding the Fifth Army. He pulled out his maps, showed his method of forward redoubts, beyond the main battle zone, and in a quiet, amiable way spoke some words which froze my blood. "'We may have to give ground,' he said, "'if the enemy attacks in strength. We may have to fall back to our main battle zone. That will not matter much. It is possible that we may have to go further back. Our real line of defense is the Somme. It will be nothing like a tragedy if we hold that. If we lose the crossings of the Somme, it will, of course, be serious.' but not a tragedy even then. It will only be tragic if we lose Amiens, and we must not do that. The crossings of the Somme? Amiens? Such a thought had never entered my imagination. General Go has suggested terrible possibilities. 
All but the worst happened. In my dispatches, reprinted in book form with explanatory prefaces, I have told in full detail the meaning and measure of the British retreat when 48 of our divisions were attacked by 114 German divisions and fell back fighting stubborn rearguard actions which at last brought the enemy to a dead halt outside Amiens and along the river Ancre, northward from Albert, where afterward in a northern attack the enemy under Prince Ruprecht of Bavaria broke through the Portuguese between Givenchy and Festebort, where our wings held, drove up to Belleule, which was burned to the ground, and caused us to abandon all the ridges of Flanders which had been gained at such great cost, and fall back to the edge of Ypres. In this book I shall not narrate all this history again. They were evil days for us. The German offensive was conducted with masterly skill, according to the new method of infiltration which had been tried against Italy with great success in the autumn of 17 at Caporetto. It consisted in a penetration of our lines by wedges of machine gunners, constantly reinforced and working inward so that our men, attacked frontally after terrific bombardment, found themselves under flanking fire on their right and left and in danger of being cut off taking advantage of a dense fog for which they had waited according to meteorological forecast the germans had easily made their way between our forward redoubts on the fifth army front where our garrisons held out for a long time completely surrounded and penetrated our inner battle zone through the gaps they made they came in masses in a great pace with immense machine gun strength and light artillery on the third army front where penetrations were made notably near Bullecourt, between the 6th and 51st Divisions, the whole of our army machine was upset for a time like a watch with a broken mainspring and loose wheels. Staffs lost touch with fighting units. Communications were broken down. Orders were given but not received. After enormous losses of men and guns, our heavy artillery was choking the roads of escape while our rear guards fought for their time rather than for ground. The crossings of the Somme were lost too easily. In the confusion and tumult of those days, some of our men, being human, were demoralized and panic-stricken, and gave ground which might have been longer held. But on the whole, and in the mass, there was no panic, and a most grim valor of men who fought for days and nights without sleep, fought when they were almost surrounded or quite surrounded, and until few of them remained to hold any kind of line. Fortunately, the Germans were unable to drag their heavy guns over the desert they had made a year before in their own retreat, and at the end of the week their pace slackened and they halted in exhaustion. I went into the swirl of our retreat day after day by Guiscard and Hume, then, as the line moved back, by Peron and Bopome, and at last on a dreadful day by the windmill at Pozieres our old heroic fighting ground, where once again, after many battles, the enemy was in Courcelet and High Wood and Deville Wood, and as I saw by going to the right through Albert, driving hard up to Memetz and Montauban. That meant the loss of all the old Somme battlefields, and that struck a chill in one's heart. But what I marveled at always was the absence of panic the fatalistic acceptance of the turn of fortune's wheel by many officers and men, and the refusal of corps and divisional staffs to give way to despair in those days of tragedy and crisis. The northern attack was in many ways worse to bear and worse to see. The menace to the coast was frightful when the enemy struck up to Bellieu and captured Kemmel Hill from the French regiment which had come up to relieve some of our exhausted and unsupported men. All through this country, between Esther and Merville, and Steenwerk and Matern, and Bellieu, thousands of civilians had been living on the edge of battlefields, believing themselves safe behind our lines. Now the line had slipped, and they were caught by German shell-fire and German guns, and after nearly four years of war had to abandon their homes like the first fugitives. I saw old women coming down lanes where 5.9s were bursting and where our gunners were getting into action. I saw young mothers packing their babies and their bundles into perambulators, while shells came hurtling over the thatched roofs of their cottages. 
I stood on the Mont de Chat, looking down upon a wide sweep of battle, and saw many little farmsteads on fire, and Bailieu, one torch of flame and smoke. There was an old monastery on the Mont de Chat, which had been in the midst of a cavalry battle in October of 1914, when Prince Max of Hesse, the Kaiser's cousin, was mortally wounded by a shot from one of our troopers. He was carried into the cell of the old prior, who watched over him in his dying hours when he spoke of his family and friends. Then his body was borne down the hill at night and buried secretly by a parish priest, and when the Kaiser wrote to the Pope, desiring to know the whereabouts of his cousin's grave, the priest to whom his message was conveyed said, Tell the Kaiser he shall know when the German armies have departed from Belgium, and when reparation has been made for all their evil deeds. It was the prior who told me that story, and described to me how the British cavalry had forged their way up the hill. He showed me the scars of bullets on the walls and the windows from which the monks looked out upon the battle. All that is a wonderful memory, said the prior. Thanks to the English, we are safe and beyond the range of German shells. I thought of his words that day. I climbed the hill to see the sweep of battle beyond. The monastery was no longer beyond the range of German shells. An eight-inch shell had just smashed into the prior's parlor. Others had opened gaps in the high roofs and walls. The monks had fled by order of the prior, who stayed behind, like the captain of a sinking ship. His corridors resounded to the tramp of army boots. The Ulster gunners had made their headquarters in the rectory, but did not stay there long. A few days later, the monastery was a ruin. From many little villages, caught by the oncoming tide of war, our soldiers helped the people to escape in lorries or on gun wagons. They did not weep nor say much, but were wonderfully brave. I remember a little family in Robeck whom I packed into my car when shells began to fall among the houses, a pretty girl with a little invalid brother in her arms and a mother by her side pointed the way to a cottage in a wood some miles away. She was gay and smiling when she said, Au revoir et merci. A few days later, the cottage and the wood were behind the German lines. The northern defense by the 55th Lancashires, 51st Highlanders, whom had all been through the Somme retreat, the 25th Division of the Cheshires, Wiltshires, and Lancashire Fusiliers, and the 9th Scottish Division, and others who fought with their backs to the wall as Sir Douglas Haig demanded of them without reliefs until they were worn thin, was heroic and tragic in its ordeal, until Foch sent up his cavalry. I saw them riding in clouds of dust and heard the panting of their horses, followed by divisions of blue men in hundreds of blue lorries tearing up the roads and forming a strong blue line behind our thin brown line. Prince Ruprecht of Bavaria had twenty-six fresh divisions in reserve, but had to hold them until other plans were developed, the Crown Prince's plan against the French and the attack on Arras. The defense of Arras was by the 3rd and 56th Divisions, the Iron Division and the London Division on the left, and by the 15th Division and guards on the right, saved the center of our line and all our line. We had a breathing space while heavy blows fell against the French and against three British divisions who had been sent to hold a quiet sector on their right. The Germans drove across the Chemin des Dames, struck right and left terrific blows, beat the French back, reached the Marne again, and threatened Paris. Foch waited to strike. The genius of Foch was that he waited until the last minute of safety, taking immense risks in order to be certain of his counterstroke. For a time he had to dissipate his reserves, but he gathered them together again. As quick as the blue men had come up behind our lines, they were withdrawn again. Three of our divisions went with them, the 51st Highlanders and 15th Scottish and the 48th English. The flower of the French army, the veterans of many battles, was massed behind the Marne, and at Chateau Terry, the American Marines and infantry were given their first big job to do. What happened, all the world knows. The Crown Prince's army was attacked on both flanks and in the center, and was sent reeling back to escape complete annihilation. Chapter 9 Ludendorff's 
great offensive had failed and turned to ruin. Some of the twenty-six fresh divisions under Ruprecht of Bavaria were put into the melting pot to save the crown prince. The British army, with its gaps filled up by 300,000 new drafts from England, the young brothers of the elder brothers who had gone before, was ready to strike again, and on August 8th the Canadians and Australians north and south of the Somme, led by many tanks, broke the enemy's lines beyond Amiens, and slowly but surely rolled it back with enormous losses. For the first time in the war the cavalry had their chance of pursuit, and made full use of it, rounding up great batches of prisoners, capturing batteries of heavy and light guns, and fighting in many actions. August 8th, writes Ludendorff, was the black day of the German army in the history of this war. He describes from the German point of view what I and others have described from the British point of view, and the general narrative is the same. A succession of hammer blows by the British armies, which broke not only the German war machine, but the German spirit. It was a marvelous feat when the 19th Division and the Welsh waited at dusk across the foul waters of the river Ancre, under the heights of Thiepval, assembled under the guns of the enemy up there, and then, wet to their skins and in small numbers, compared with the strength of the enemy, stormed the huge ridges from both sides and hurled the enemy back from what he thought was an impregnable position, and followed him day by day, taking thousands of prisoners and smashing his rearguard defenses one by one. The most decisive battle of the British front in the comeback after our days of retreat was when the gallant help of American troops from the 27th New York Division, our men of the English Midlands, the 47th Division, and others broke the main Hindenburg line along St. Quentin Canal. That canal was sixty feet wide, with the steep cliffs rising sheer to the wonderful system of German machine-gun redoubts and tunnel defenses between the villages of Bellecourt and Bellinglis. It seemed to me an impossible place to assault and capture. If the enemy could not hold that line, they could hold nothing. In a dense fog on Sunday morning, September 30th, our men, with the Americans and Australians in support, went down to the canal bank, waded across where the water was shallow, swam across in life belts where it was deep, or got across somehow and anyhow under bursts of machine gun fire by rafts and plank bridges. A few hours after the beginning of the battle, they were far out beyond the German side of the canal, with masses of prisoners in their hands. The Americans on the left of the attack, where the canal goes below ground, showed superb and reckless gallantry. They forgot, however, to mop up behind them, so that the enemy came out of his tunnels and the Australians had to cut their way through. And that evening I met their escorts with droves of captured Germans. They had helped to break the last defensive system of the enemy opposite the British front, and after that our troops fought through open country on the way to victory. I saw many of the seams which led up to Mons and Le Cateau, and afterwards to the Rhine. Something of the horror of war passed when the enemy drew back slowly in retreat from the lands he had invaded, and we liberated great cities like Lille and Robay and Tolking, and scores of towns and villages where the people had been waiting for us for so long, and now wept with joy to see us. The entry into Lille was unforgettable when old men and women and girls and boys and little children crowded round us and kissed our hands. So it was in other places. Yet not all the horror had passed. In Cotray, in saint Normand, by Valenciennes, in Hohan and other villages, the enemy's shell-fire and poison gas killed and injured many of the people who had been under the German yoke so long and now thought they were safe. Hospitals were filled with women gasping for breath, with gas fumes in their lungs, and with dying children. In Valenciennes, the cellars were flooded when I walked there on its day of capture, so that when shells began to fall the people could not go down to shelter. Some of them did not try to go down. At an open window sat an old veteran of 1870, with his medal on his breast, and with his daughter and granddaughter on each side of his chair. He called out, Merci, merci, when English soldiers passed, and when I stopped a moment, clasped my hands through the window and could not speak for the tears which fell down his white and withered cheeks. A few dead Germans lay about the streets, 
and in Maubeuge on the day before the armistice I saw the last dead German of the war in that part of the line. He lay stretched outside the railway station, into which many shells had crashed. It was as though he had walked from his own comrades toward our line before a bullet caught him. Ludendorff writes of the broken morale of the German troops, and of how his men surrendered to single troopers and ours, while whole detachments gave themselves up to tanks. Retiring troops, he wrote, greeted one particular division, the cavalry, that was going up fresh and gallantly to the attack, with shouts of, Black legs and war prolongers. That is true. When the Germans left Bohan, they shouted out to the French girls, The English are coming! Bravo! The war will soon be over! On a day in September, when British troops broke the drocourt quant line, I saw the second German guards coming along in batches, like companies, and after they had been put in barbed wire enclosures, they laughed and clapped at the sight of other crowds of comrades coming down as prisoners. I thought then, something has broken in the German spirit. For the first time, the end seemed very near. Yet the German rear guards fought stubbornly in many places, especially in the last battles around Cambrai, where on the north the Canadian Corps had to fight desperately and suffered heavy and bitter losses under machine-gun fire, while on the south our naval division and others were badly cut up. General Curry, whom I saw during those days, was anxious and disheartened. He was losing more men in machine-gun actions round Cambrai than in bigger battles. I watched those actions from Bourlon Wood saw the last German railway train steam out of town, and went into the city early in the morning of its capture, when there was a roaring fire in the heart of it, and the Canadians were routing out the last Germans from their hiding places. The British army could not have gone on much farther after November 11th, when the armistice brought us to a halt. For three months our troops had fought incessantly, storming many villages strongly garrisoned with machine gunners, crossing many canals under heavy fire, and losing many comrades all along the way. The pace could not have been kept up. There was a limit even to the valor of British troops, and for a time we had reached that limit. There were not many divisions who could have staggered on to new attacks without rest and relief, but they had broken the German armies against them by a succession of hammer strokes, astounding in their rapidity and in their continuity, which I need not here describe in detail because in my dispatches, now in book form, I have narrated the history as I was a witness of it day by day. Elsewhere, the French and Americans had done their part with steady driving pressure. The illimitable reserves of Americans and their fighting quality, which triumphed over a faulty organization of transport and supplies, left the German high command without hope even for a final gamble. Before them, the German troops were in revolt at last, against the bloody, futile sacrifice of their manhood and people. A blinding light had come to them, revealing the criminality of their warlords in this great swindle against their race. It was defeat and agony which enlightened them, as most people, even ourselves, are enlightened only by suffering and disillusionment, and never by successes. Chapter 10 After the armistice, I went with our troops to the Rhine, and entered Cologne with them, that was the most fantastic adventure of all in four and a half years of strange and terrible adventures. To me, there was no wild exultation in the thought of being in Cologne with our conquering army, the thought of all the losses on the way, and of all the futility of this strife, smote in one's heart. What fools the Germans had been! What tragic fools! What a mad villainy there had been among rival dynasties and powers and politicians and peoples to lead to this massacre. What had any one gained out of it all? Nothing except ruin. Nothing except great death and poverty and remorse and revolt. The German people received us humbly. They were eager to show us courtesy and submission. It was a chance for our young Junkers, for the Prussian in the hearts of young pups of ours, who could play the petty tyrant, shout at the German waiters, refuse to pay their bills, bully shopkeepers, insult unoffending citizens. A few young staff officers behaved like that, disgustingly. The officers of fighting battalions and the men were very different. It was a strange study in psychology to watch them. Here they were among the Huns, 
The men they passed in the streets and sat with in the restaurants had been in German uniforms a few weeks before, or a few days. They were the enemy, the men they had tried to kill, the men who had tried to kill them. They had actually fought against them in the same places. At the Domhof Hotel, I overheard a conversation between a young waiter and three of our cavalry officers. They had been in the same fight in the village of Noyel, near Cambrai, a tiny place of ruin where they had crouched under machine-gun fire. The waiter drew a diagram on the tablecloth. I was just there. The three cavalry officers laughed. Extraordinary! We were a few yards away. They chatted with the waiter as though he were an old acquaintance who had played against them in a famous football match. They did not try to kill him with a table knife. He did not put poison in the soup. That young waiter had served in a hotel in Manchester, where he had served a friend of mine, to whom he now expressed his opinion on the folly of the war, and the criminality of his warlords, and things in general. Among these last he uttered an epigram which I remember for its brutal simplicity. It was when a staff officer of ours, rather the worse for wine, had been making a scene with the head waiter, bullying him in a strident voice. Some English gentlemen are swine, said the young waiter, but all German gentlemen are swine. Some of our officers and men, billeted in houses outside Cologne or across the Rhine, endeavored to stand on distant terms with the Huns, but it was impossible to be discourteous when the old lady of the house brought them an early cup of coffee before breakfast, warmed their boots before the kitchen fire, and said, God be praised, the war is over. For English soldiers, anything like hostility was ridiculous in the presence of German boys and girls who swarmed round their horses and guns, kissed their hands, brought them little pictures and gifts. Kids are kids, said a sergeant major. I don't want to cut their throats. Queer, ain't it? Many of the kids looked half-starved. Our men gave them bread and biscuit and bully beef. In Cologne, the people seemed pleased to see British soldiers. There was no sense of humiliation no agony of grief at this foreign occupation. Was it lack of pride, cringing, or profound relief that the river of blood had ceased to flow, and even a sense of protection against the revolutionary mob which had looted their houses before our entry? Almost every family had lost one son, some of them two, three, or even five sons, in that orgy of slaughter. They had paid a dreadful price for pride. Their ambition had been drowned in blood. In the restaurants, orchestras played gay music. Once I heard them playing old English melodies, and I sickened a little at that. That was going too far. I looked round the Café Brower, a strange scene after four and a half years Hun-hating. English soldiers were chatting with Germans, clinking beer mugs with them. The Germans lifted their hats to English Tommies. Our men, Canadian and English, said cheerio to German soldiers in uniforms without shoulder straps or buttons. English people, still talking of Huns, demanding vengeance and maintenance of the blockade, would have become hysterical if they had come suddenly to this German café before the signing of peace. Long before peace was signed at Versailles, it had been made on the Rhine. Stronger than the hate of war was human nature. Face to face, British soldiers found that every German had two eyes, a nose, and a mouth, in spite of being a Hun. As ecclesiastics would say when not roused to patriotic fury, they had been made in the image of God. There were pleasant-spoken women in the shops and in the farmhouses. Blue-eyed girls with flaxen pigtails curtsied very prettily to English officers. They were clean. Their houses were clean, more spotless even than English homes. When soldiers turned on a tap, they found water came out of it. Wonderful! The sanitary arrangements were good. Servants were hard-working and dutiful. There was something, after all, in German Kultur. At night the children said their prayer to the Christian God. Most of them were Catholics and very pious. They seem good people, said English soldiers. At night in the streets of Cologne were women not so good. Shameless women, though daintily dressed and comely. British soldiers, English, Scottish, and Canadian, grinned back at their laughing eyes, entered into converse with them, found they could all speak English, 
went down side streets with them to narrow fronted houses there were squalid scenes when the apm raided those houses and broke up an entente cordiale that was flagrant and scandalous astonishing climax to the drama of war no general orders could stop fraternization before peace was signed human nature asserted itself against all artificial restrictions and false passion friends of mine who had been violent in their hatred of all germans became thoughtful and said of course there are exceptions and the innocent must not suffer for the guilty and we can afford to be a little generous now but the innocent were made to suffer for the guilty and we were not generous we maintained the blockade and german children starved and german mothers weakened and german girls swooned in the tram cars and german babies died ludendorff did not starve or die neither did hindenburg nor any german warlord nor any profiteer down the streets of cologne came people of the rich middle classes who gorged themselves on buns and cakes for afternoon tea they were cakes of ersatz flour and ersatz cream and not very healthy or nutritious though very expensive but in the side streets among the working women there was as i found the wolf of hunger standing with open jaws at every doorway it was not actual starvation but what the germans called unternahrung undernourishment producing rickety children consumptive girls and men out of whom vitality had gone they stinted and scraped on miserable substitutes and never had enough to eat yet they were the people who for two years at least had denounced the war had sent up petitions for peace and had written to their men in the trenches about the great swindle and the gilded ones they were powerless as some of them told me because of the secret police and martial law what could they do against the government with all their men away at the front they were treated like pigs like dirt they could only suffer and pray they had a little hope that in the future if france and england were not too hard they might pay back for the guilt of their warlords and see a new germany arise out of its ruin freed from militarism and with greater liberties so humble people talked to us when i went among them with a friend who spoke good german better than my elementary knowledge i believed in their sincerity which had come through suffering though i believed that newspaper editors many people in the official classes and the old military castes were still implacable in hatred and unrepentant the german people deserved punishment for their share in the guilt of war they had been punished by frightful losses of life by the multitude of cripples by the ruin of their empire when they told me of their hunger i could not forget the hungry wives and children of france and belgium who had been captives in their own land behind german lines nor our prisoners who had been starved until many of them died when i walked through german villages and pitied the women who yearned for their men still prisoners in our hands nearly a year after the armistice and long after peace a cruelty which shamed us i think i remembered hundreds of french villages broken into dust by german gunfire burned by incendiary shells and that vast desert of the battlefields of france and belgium which never in our time will regain its life as a place of human habitation when germans said our industry is ruined our trade is killed i thought of the factories in lille and many towns from which all machinery had been taken or in which all machinery had been broken i thought of the thousand crimes of their war the agony of millions of people upon whose liberties they had tramped and upon whose necks they had imposed a brutal yoke yet even with all those memories of tragic scenes which in this book are but lightly sketched i hoped that the peace we should impose would not be one of vengeance by which the innocent would pay for the sins of the guilty the children for their father's lust the women for their warlords the soldiers who hated war for those who drove them to the shambles but that this peace should in justice and mercy lead the working people of europe out of the misery in which all were plunged and by the policy no higher than common sense but as high as that establish a new phase of civilization in which military force would be reduced to the limits of safety for european peoples eager to end the folly of war and get back to work I hoped too much. There was no such peace. End of section 21
Section 22 of Now It Can Be Told by Philip Gibbs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 8 For What Men Died. Chapters 1 to 4. Chapter 1. In this book I have written in a blunt way some episodes of the war as I observed them and gained first-hand knowledge of them in their daily traffic. I have not painted the picture blacker than it was, nor selected gruesome morsels and joined them together to make a jigsaw puzzle for ghoulish delight. Unlike Henri Barbousse, who, in his dreadful book Le Feu, gave the unrelieved blackness of this human drama, I have here, and in other books, shown the light as well as the shade in which our men lived, the gaiety as well as the fear they had, the exultation as well as the agony of battle the spiritual ardor of boys, as well as the brutality of the task that was theirs. I have tried to set down as many aspects of the war's psychology as I could find in my remembrance of these years, without exaggeration or false emphasis, so that out of their confusion, even out of their contradiction, the real truth of the adventure might be seen as it touched the souls of men. Yet, when one strives to sum up the evidence and reach definite conclusions about the motives which led men of the warring nations to kill one another year after year in those fields of slaughter, the ideals for which so many millions of men laid down their lives, and the effect of those years of carnage upon the philosophy of this present world of men, there is no clear line of thought or conviction. It is difficult at least to forecast the changes that will be produced by this experience in the social structure of civilized peoples, and in their relations to one another, though it is certain, even now, that out of the passion of the war a new era in the world's history is being born. The ideas of vast masses of people have been revolutionized by the thoughts that were stirred up in them during those years of intense suffering. No system of government designed by men, afraid of the new ideas, will have power to kill them, though they may throttle them for time. For good or ill, I know not which, the ideas germinated in trenches and dugouts, in towns under shell fire or bomb fire, in hearts stricken by personal tragedy or world agony, will prevail over the old order which dominated the nations of Europe, and the old philosophy of political and social governance will be challenged and perhaps overthrown. If the new ideas are thwarted, by reactionary rulers endeavoring to jerk the world back to its old-fashioned discipline under their authority, there will be anarchy reaching to the heights of terror in more countries than those where anarchy now prevails. If by fear or by wisdom the new ideas are allowed to gain their ground gradually, a revolution will be accomplished without anarchy. But in any case, for good or ill, a revolution will happen. It has happened in the sense that already there is no resemblance between this Europe after the war and that Europe before the war in the mental attitude of the masses toward the problems of life. In every country there are individuals, men and women, who are going about as though what had happened had made no difference, and as though after a period of restlessness the people will settle down to the old style of things. They are merely sleepwalkers. There are others who see clearly enough that they cannot govern or dupe the people with old spell words, and they are struggling desperately to think out new words which may help them to regain their power over simple minds. The old gangs are organizing a new system of defense, building a new kind of Hindenburg line behind which they are dumping their political ammunition. But their Hindenburg line is not impregnable. The angry murmur of the mob highly organized, disciplined, passionate, trained to fight, is already approaching the outer bastions. In Russia the mob is in possession, wiping the blood out of their eyes after the nightmare of anarchy, encompassed by forces of the old regime, and not knowing yet whether its victory is won or how to shape the new order that must follow chaos. In Germany there is only the psychology of stunned people, broken for a time in body and spirit, after stupendous efforts and bloody losses which led to ruin and the complete destruction of their old pride, philosophy, and power. The revolution that has happened there is strange and rather pitiful. It was not caused by the willpower of the people, but by a cessation of willpower, 
they did not overthrow their ruling dynasty their tyrants the tyrants fled and the people were not angry nor sorry nor fierce nor glad they were stupefied members of the old order joined hands with those of the people's parties out to evolve a republic with new ideals based upon the people's will and inspired by the people's passion the germans after the armistice and after peace had no passion as they had no will they were in a state of coma the knockout blow had happened to them and they were incapable of action they just ceased from action they had been betrayed to this ruin by their military and political rulers but they had not vitality enough to demand vengeance on those men the extent of their ruin was so great that it annihilated anger political passion pride all emotion except that of despair how could they save something out of the remnants of power that had been theirs how could they keep alive feed their women and children pay their monstrous debts they had lost their faith as well as their war nothing that they had believed was true they had believed in their invincible armies and the armies had bled to death and broken they had believed in the supreme military genius of their warlords and the warlords blunderers as well as criminals had led them to the abyss and dropped them over they had believed in the divine mission of the german people as a civilizing force and now they were despised by all other peoples as a brutal and barbarous race in spite of german music german folk songs german art german sentiment they had been abandoned by god by the protecting hand of the altes gutes deutsches gottes to whom they had prayed for comfort and help in those years of war in protestant churches and catholic churches with deep piety and childlike faith what sins had they done that they should be abandoned by god the invasion of belgium that they argued was a tragic necessity atrocities those were they believed the inventions of their enemies there had been stern things done terrible things but according to the laws of war Montier had been shot that was war hostages had been shot it was to save german lives from slaughter by civilians individual brutalities yes there were brutes in all armies the u-boat war it was said the german patriot to break a blockade that was starving millions of german children to slow death condemning millions to consumption rickets all manner of disease nurse cavell she pleaded guilty to a crime that was punishable as she knew by death she was a brave woman who took her risk open-eyed and was judged according to the justice of war which is very cruel poison gas why not said german soldiers when to be gassed was less terrible than to be blown to bits by high explosives they had been the first to use that new method of destruction as the english were the first to use tanks terrible also in their destructiveness germany was guilty of this war had provoked it against peaceful peoples no a thousand times no they had been said the troubled soul of germany encompassed with enemies they had plotted to close her in russia was a huge menace France had entered into alliance with Russia and was waiting her chance to grab an Alsace-Lorraine. Italy was ready for betrayal. England hated the power of Germany and was in secret alliance with France and Russia. Germany had struck to save herself. It was a war of self-defense to save the fatherland. The German people still clung desperately to those ideas after the armistice, as I found in Cologne and other towns and as friends of mine who had visited berlin told me after peace was signed the germans refused to believe in accusations of atrocity they knew that some of these stories had been faked by hostile propaganda and knowing that as we know they thought all were false they said lies 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 and made counter charges against the russians and poles they could not bring themselves to believe that their sons and brothers had been more brutal than the laws of war allow and what brutality they had done was imposed upon them by ruthless discipline but they deplored the war and the common people ex-soldiers and civilians cursed the rich and governing classes who had made profit out of it and continued it when they might have made peace with honor that was their accusation against their leaders that and the ruthless bloody way in which their men had been hurled into the furnace on a gambler's chance of victory while they were duped by faked promises of victory 
when not put upon their defense by accusations against the whole fatherland the german people as far as i could tell by talking with a few of them and by those letters which fell into our hands revolted in spirit against the monstrous futility and idiocy of the war and were convinced in their souls that its origin lay in the greed and pride of the governing classes of all nations who would use men's bodies as counters in a devil's game that view was expressed in the signboards put above the parapet we're all fools let's all go home and in that letter by the women who wrote for the poor here it is terrible and yet the rich the gilded ones the bloated aristocrats gobble up everything in front of our very eyes all soldiers friend and foe ought to throw down their weapons and go on strike so that this war which enslaves the people more than ever may cease it is that view terrible in its simplicity which may cause a more passionate revolution in germany when the people awaken from their stupor it was that view which led to the russian revolution and to bolshevism it is the suspicion which is creeping into the brains of british working men and making them threaten to strike against any adventure of war like that in russia which seems to them unless proved otherwise on behalf of the gilded ones and for the enslavement of the peoples not to face that truth is to deny the passionate convictions of masses of men in europe that is one key to the heart of the revolutionary movement which is surging beneath the surface of our european state it is the belief of many brooding minds that almost as great as the direct guilt of the german warlords was the guilt of the whole political society of europe whose secret diplomacy unrevealed to the peoples was based upon hatred and fear and rivalry in play for imperial power and the world's markets as common folk play dominoes for penny points and risking the lives of common folk in a gamble for enormous stakes of territory imperial prestige and personal vanity of politicians the vast private gain of trusts and profiteers to keep the living counters quiet to make them jump into the pool of their own free will at the word go the statesmen diplomats trusts and profiteers debauch the name of patriotism raise the watchword of liberty and play upon the ignorance of the mob easily skillfully by inciting them to race hatred by inflaming the brute passion in them and by concocting a terrible mixture of false idealism and self-interest so that simple minds quick to respond to sentiment as well as those quick to hear the call of the beast rally shoulder to shoulder and march to the battlegrounds under the spell of that potion some go with a noble sense of sacrifice some with bloodlust in their hearts most with the herd instinct following the lead little knowing that they are but the pawns of a game which is being played behind closed doors by the great gamblers in the courts and foreign offices and committee rooms and counting houses of the political casinos in europe i have heard the expression of this view from soldiers during the war and since the war at street corners and tram cars and in conversations with railway men mechanics policemen and others who were soldiers a year ago or stay-at-homes thinking hard over the meaning of the war i am certain that millions of men are thinking these things because i found the track of those common thoughts crude simple dangerous among canadian soldiers crossing the atlantic in canadian towns and in the united states as i had begun to see the trail of them far back in the early days of the war when i moved among french soldiers belgian soldiers and our own men my own belief is not so simple as that i do not divorce all peoples from their governments as victims of a subtle tyranny devised by statesmen and diplomats of diabolical cunning and by financial magnates ready to exploit human life for greater gains i see the evil which led to the crime of the war and to the crimes of the peace with deep spread roots to the very foundation of human society the fear of statesmen upon which all international relations were based was in the hearts of peoples france was afraid of germany and screwed up her military service her war preparations to the limit of national endurance the majority of the people of france accepting the burden as inevitable and right because of her fear of germany france made her alliance with russian tsardom her entente cordiale with imperial england and the french people poured their money into russian loans as a life insurance against the german menace french statesmen 
knew that their diplomacy was supported by the majority of the people by their ignorance as well as by their knowledge so it was in germany the spell words of the german warlords expressed the popular sentiment of the german people which was largely influenced by the fear of russia in alliance with france by fear and envy of the british empire and england's sea power and by the faith that germany must break through that hostile combination at all costs in order to fulfill the high destiny which was marked out for her as she thought by the genius and industry of her people the greed of the bloated aristocrats was only on a bigger scale than the greed of the small shopkeepers the desire to capture new markets belonged not only to statesmen but to commercial travelers the german peasant believed as much in the might of the german armies as hindenburg and ludendorff the brutality of german generals was not worse than that of unteroffizier or the foreman of works in england there was no traditional hatred of germany but for some years distrust and suspicions which had been vented in the newspapers with taunts and challenges stinging the pride of germans and playing into the hands of the junker caste our war psychology was different from that of our allies because of our island position and our faith in sea power which had made us immune from the fear of invasion it took some time to awaken the people to a sense of real peril and of personal menace to their hearths and homes to the very end masses of english folk believed that we were fighting for the rescue of other people belgian french serbian rumanian and not for the continuance of our imperial power the official propaganda the words and actions of british statesmen did actually express the conscious and subconscious psychology of the multitude the call to the old watchwords of national pride and imperial might thrilled the soul of a people of proud tradition in sea battles and land battles appeals for the rescue of the little nations struck old chords of chivalry and sentiment though with a strange lack of logic and sincerity irish demand for self-government was unheeded base passions as well as noble instincts were stirred easily greedy was the appetite of the mob for atrocity tales the more revolting they were the quicker they were swallowed the foul absurdity of the corpse factory was not rejected any more than the tale of the crucified canadian disproved by our own g h q or the cutting off of children's hands and women's breasts for which i could find no evidence from the only british ambulances working in the districts where such horrors were reported spy mania flourished in mean streets german music was banned in english drawing-rooms preachers and professors denied any quality of virtue or genius to german poets philosophers scientists or scholars a critical weighing of evidence was regarded as pro-germanism and lack of patriotism truth was delivered bound to passion hatred at home inspired largely by feminine hysteria and official propaganda reached such heights that when fighting men came back on leave their refusal to say much against their enemy their straightforward assertions that fritz was not so black as he was painted that he fought bravely died gamely and in the prison camps was well-mannered decent industrious good-natured were heard with shock silence by mothers and sisters who could only excuse this absence of hate on the score of war weariness chapter two the people of all countries were deeply involved in the general blood guiltiness of europe they made no passion appeal in the name of christ or in the name of humanity for the cessation of the slaughter of boys and the suicide of nations and for a reconciliation of peoples upon terms of some more reasonable argument than that of high explosives peace proposals from the pope from germany from austria were rejected with fierce denunciation most passionate scorn as peace plots and peace traps not without the terrible logic of the vicious circle because indeed there was no sincerity of renunciation in some of those offers of peace and the powers hostile to us were simply trying our strength and our weakness in order to make their own kind of peace which should be that of conquest the gamblers playing the game of poker with crowns and armies as their stakes were upheld generally by the peoples who would not abate one point of pride 
one fraction of hate, one claim of vengeance, though all Europe should fail in ruin and the last legions of boys be massacred. There was no call from people to people across the frontiers of hostility. Let us end this homicidal mania. Let us get back to sanity and save our younger sons. Let us hand over to justice those who will continue the slaughter of our youth. There was no forgiveness, no generous instinct, no large-hearted common sense in any combatant nation of Europe. Like wolves, they had their teeth in one another's throats, and would not let go, though all bloody and exhausted, until one should fall at the last gasp to be mangled by the others. Yet in each nation, even in Germany, there were men and women who saw the folly of the war and the crime of it, and desired to end it by some act of renunciation and repentance, and by some uplifting of the people's spirit to vault the frontiers of hatred and the barbed wire which hedged in patriotism. Some of them were put in prison. Most of them saw the impossibility of counteracting the forces of insanity which had made the world mad and kept silent, hiding their thoughts and brooding over them. The leaders of the nations continued to use mob passion as their argument and justification, excited it anew when its fires burned low, focused it upon definite objectives, and gave it a sense of righteousness by the high-sounding watchwords of liberty, justice, honor, and retribution. Each side proclaimed Christ as its captain and invoked the blessing and aid of the God of Christendom, though Germans were allied with Turks and France was full of black and yellow men. The German people did not try to avert their ruin by denouncing the criminal acts of their warlords, nor by deploring the cruelties they had committed. Allies did not help them to do so because of their lust for bloody vengeance and their desire for the spoils of victory. The people shared the blame of their rulers because they were not nobler than their rulers. They cannot now plead ignorance or betrayal by false ideals which dupe them, because character does not depend on knowledge, and it was the character of European peoples which failed in the crisis of the world's fate, so that they followed the call back of the beast in the jungle rather than the voice of the crucified one whom they pretended to adore. Chapter 3 The character of European peoples failed in common sense and in Christian charity. It did not fail in courage to endure great agonies, to suffer death largely, to be obedient to the tradition of patriotism and to the stoic spirit of old fighting races. In courage, I do not think, there was much difference between the chief combatants. The Germans, as a race, were wonderfully brave until their spirit was broken by the sure knowledge of defeat and by lack of food. Many times, through all those years, they marched shoulder to shoulder, obedient to discipline, to certain death, as I saw them on the psalm, like martyrs. They marched for their fatherland, inspired by the spirit of the German race, as it had entered their souls by the memory of old German songs, old heroic ballads, their German home life, their German women, their love of little old towns on hillsides or in valleys, by all the meaning to them of that word Germany, which is like the name of England to us who is fool enough to think otherwise, and fought often a thousand times to the death as I saw their bodies heaped in the fields of the Somme and round their pillboxes in Flanders, and in the last phase of the war behind the Hindenburg line, round their broken batteries on the way to Mons and La Cateau. The German people endured years of semi-starvation and a drain of blood greater than any other fighting people, two million dead, before they lost all vitality, hope, and pride, and made their abject surrender. At the beginning, they were out for conquest, inspired by arrogance and pride. Before the end, they had fought desperately to defend the fatherland from the doom which cast its black shadow on them as it drew near. They were brave, those Germans, whatever the brutality of individual men and the cold-blooded cruelty of their commanders. The courage of France is to me like an old heroic song, stirring the heart. It was medieval in its complete adherence to the faith of valor and its spirit of sacrifice for la patrie. If patriotism were enough as the gospel of life, Nurse Cavell did not think so. France as a nation was perfect in that faith. 
Her people had no doubt as to their duty. It was to defend their sacred soil from the enemy which had invaded it. It was to hurl the brutes back from the fair fields they had ravaged and despoiled. It was to liberate their brothers and sisters from the outrageous tyranny of the German yoke in the captured country. It was to seek vengeance for bloody, foul, and abominable deeds. In the first days of the war, France was struck by heavy blows, which sent her armies reeling back in retreat. But before the first battle of the Marne, when her peril was greatest, when Paris seemed doomed, the spirit of the French soldiers rose to a supreme act of faith, which was fulfilled when Foch attacked in the center, when Maroni struck on the enemy's flank, and hundreds of thousands of young Frenchmen hurled themselves, reckless of life, upon the monster which faltered and then fled behind the shelter of the inn. With bloodshot eyes and parched throats and swollen tongues, blind with sweat and blood, mad with the heat and fury of attack, the French soldiers fought through that first battle of the Marne and saved France from defeat and despair. After that, year after year, they flung themselves against the German defense and died in heaps, or held their lines, as at Verdun, against colossal onslaught, until the dead lay in masses. But the living said, They shall not pass, and kept their word. The people of France, above all the women of France, behind the lines, were the equals of the fighting men in valor. They fought with despair through many black months, and did not yield. They did the work of their men in the fields, and knew that many of them, the sons or brothers or lovers or husbands, would never return for the harvest time, but did not cry to have them back until the enemy should be thrust out of France. Behind the German line, under German rule, the French people, prisoners in their own land, suffered most in spirit, but were proud and patient in endurance. "'Why don't your people give in?' asked a German officer of a woman in Nestle. "'France is bleeding to death. "'We shall go on for two years, or three years, or four, or five, "'and in the end we shall smash you,' said the woman who told me this. "'The German officer stared at her and said, "'You people are wonderful.' "'Yes, they were wonderful, the French, and their hatred of the Germans, "'their desire for vengeance, complete and terrible at all cost of life, "'even though France should bleed to death and die after victory.' is to be understood in the heights and depths of its hatred and in the passion of its love for France and liberty. When I think of France, I am tempted to see no greater thing than such patriotism as that to justify the gospel of hate against such an enemy, to uphold vengeance as a sweet virtue. Yet, if I did so, I should deny the truth that has been revealed to many men and women by the agony of the war, that if civilization may continue, patriotism is not enough. That international hatred will produce other wars, worse than this, in which civilization will be submerged, and that vengeance, even for dreadful crimes, cannot be taken of a nation without punishing the innocent more than the guilty, so that out of its cruelty and injustice new fires of hatred are lighted. The demand for vengeance passes to the other side, and the devil finds another vicious circle in which to trap the souls of men and catch em all alive oh to deny that would also be a denial of the faith with which millions of young frenchmen rushed to the colors in the first days of the war it was they who said this is a war to end war they told me so it was they who said german militarism must be killed so that all militarism shall be abolished this is a war for liberty so soldiers of France spoke to me on a night when Paris was mobilized and the tragedy began. It is a Frenchman, Henri Barbousse, who, in spite of the German invasion, the outrages against his people, the agony of France, has the courage to say that all peoples in Europe were involved in the guilt of that war because of their adherence to that old barbaric creed of brute force and the superstitious servitude of their souls to symbols of national pride based upon military tradition. He even denounces the salute to the flag, instinctive and sacred in the heart of every Frenchman, as a fetish worship in which the narrow bigotry of national arrogance is raised above the rights of the common masses of men. He draws no distinction between a war of defense and a war of aggression, because attack is the best means of defense, 
and all peoples who go to war dupe themselves into the belief that they do so in defense of their liberties and rights and power and property germany attacked france first because she was ready first and sure of her strength france would have attacked germany first to get back alsace lorraine to wipe out eighteen seventy if she also had been ready and sure of her strength the political philosophy on both sides of the rhine was the same it was based on military power and rivalry of secret alliances and imperial ambitions the large-hearted internationalism of jean jarre who with all his limitations was a great frenchman patriot and idealist had failed among his own people and in germany and the assassin's bullet was his reward for the adventure of his soul to lift civilization above the level of the old jungle law and to save france from the massacre which happened in war france was wonderful most heroic in sacrifice most splendid in valor in her dictated peace which was ours also her leaders were betrayed by the very evil which millions of young frenchmen had gone out to kill at the sacrifice of their own lives militarism was exalted in france above the ruins of german militarism it was the peace of vengeance which punished the innocent more than the guilty the babe at the breast more than the junker in his schloss the poor working woman more than the warlord the peasant who had been driven to the shambles more than sixt von arnim or ruprecht of bavaria or ludendorff or hindenburg it is a peace that can only be maintained by power of artillery and by the conscription of every french boy who shall be trained for the next war defense twenty years hence thirty years hence when germany is strong again stronger than france because of her population stronger than enormously than france in relative numbers of able-bodied men than in august nineteen fourteen so if that philosophy continue and i do not think it will the old fear will be re-established the old burdens of armament will be piled up anew the people of france will be weighed down as before under a military regime stifling their liberty of thought and action wasting the best years of their boyhood in barracks seeking protective alliances buying allies at great cost establishing the old spy system the old diplomacy the old squalid ways of international politics based as before on fear and force marshal foch was a fine soldier clemenceau was a strong minister of war there was no man great enough in france to see beyond the passing triumph of military victory and by supreme generosity of soul to lift their enemy out of the dirt of their despair so that the new german republic should arise from the ruins of the empire remorseful of their deeds in france and belgium with all their rage directed against their ancient tyranny and with a newborn spirit of democratic liberty reaching across the old frontiers is that the foolish dream of the sentimentalist no no more than that for the german people after their agony were ready to respond to generous dealing pitiful in their need of it and there is enough sentiment in german hearts the most sentimental people in europe to rise with a surge of emotion to a new gospel of atonement if their old enemies had offered a chance of grace france has not won the war by her terms of peace nor safeguarded her frontiers for more than a few uncertain years by harking back to the old philosophy of militarism she has re-established peril amid a people drained of blood and deeply in debt her support of reactionary forces in russia is to establish a government which will guarantee the interest on french loans and organize a new military regime in alliance with france and england Meanwhile, France looks to the United States and British people to protect her from the next war, when Germany shall be strong again. She is playing the militarist role without the strength to sustain it. Chapter 4 What of England? Looking back at the immense effort of the British people in the war, our high sum of sacrifice in blood and treasure, and the patient courage of our fighting men, the world must and does indeed acknowledge that the old stoic virtue of our race was called out by this supreme challenge and stood the strain the traditions of a thousand years of history filled with war and travail and adventure by which old fighting races had blended with different strains of blood and temper roman celtic saxon danish norman survived in the fiber of our modern youth country-bred or city-bred 
in spite of the weakening influences of slumdom, vicious environment, ill nourishment, clerkship, and sedentary life. The Londoner was a good soldier. The Liverpools and Manchesters were hard and tough in attack and defense. The South Country battalions of Devons and Dorsets, Sussex and Somersets, were not behindhand in ways of death. The Scots had not lost their fire and passion, but were terrible in their onslaught. The Irish battalions, with recruiting cut off at the base, fought with their old gallantry until there were few to answer the last roll call. The Welsh dragon encircled Mamet's wood, devoured the cockchafers on Pilgrim Ridge, and were hard on the trail of the Black Eagle in the last offensive. The Australians and Canadians had all the British quality of courage and the benefit of a harder physique gained by outdoor life and unweakened ancestry. In the mass, apart from neurotic types here and there among officers and men, the stock was true and strong. The spirit of a seafaring race, which has the salt in its blood from Land's End to John O'Goats and back again to Wapping, had not been destroyed, but answered the ruffle of Drake's drum, and with simplicity and gravity in Royal Navy and in Merchant Marine, swept the highways of the seas, hunted worse monsters than any fabulous creatures of the deep, and shirked no dread adventure in the storms and darkness of a spacious hell. The men who went to Zeebrugge were the true sons of those who fought the Spanish Armada and singed the King of Spain's beard in Cadiz harbor. The victors of the Jutland battle were better men than Nelson's, the scourings of the prisons and the sweepings of the press gang, and not less brave in frightful hours. Without the service of the British seamen, the war would have been lost for France and Italy and Belgium and all of us. The flower of our youth went out to France and Flanders, to Egypt, Palestine, Gallipoli, Mesopotamia, and Saloniki, and was a fine flower of gallant boyhood, clean, for the most part eager, not brutal, except by intensive training, simple in minds and hearts, chivalrous in instinct, without hatred, adventurous, laughter-loving, and dutiful. That is God's truth. In spite of the vice rotted criminal, degenerate, and brutal fellows in many battalions, as in all crowds of men. In millions of words during the years of war, I recorded the bravery of our troops on the Western Front, their patience, their cheerfulness, suffering, and agony, yet with all those words describing day by day the incidents of their life in war, I did not exaggerate the splendor of their stoic spirit or the measure of their sacrifice. The heroes of mythology were but paltry figures compared with those who, in the great war, went forward to the roaring devils of modern gunfire, dwelt amid high explosives more dreadful than dragons, breathed in the fumes of poison gas more foul than the breath of Medusa, watched and slept above mine craters which upheaved the hellfire of Pluto, and defied thunderbolts more certain in death-dealing blows than those of Jove. Something there was in the spirit of our men which led them to endure these things without revolt, ideals higher than the selfish motives of life. They did not fight for greed or glory, not for conquest, nor for vengeance. Hatred was not the inspiration of the mass of them, for I am certain that except in hours when men see red, there was no direct hatred of the men in the opposite trenches, but on the other hand, a queer sense of fellow-feeling a humorous sympathy for our old Fritz, who was in the same bloody mess as themselves. Our generals, it is true, hated the Germans. I should like one week in Cologne, one of them told me, before there seemed ever a chance of getting there, and I would let my men loose in the streets and turn a blind eye to anything they liked to do. Some of our officers were inspired by a bitter, unrelenting hate. If I had a thousand Germans in a row, one of them said to me, I would cut all their throats and enjoy the job. But that was not the mentality of the men in the ranks, except those who were murderers by nature and pleasure. They gave their cigarettes to prisoners, and filled their water bottles, and chatted in a friendly way with any German who spoke a little English, as I have seen them time and time again on days of battle, in the fields of battle. There are exceptions to this treatment. But even the Australians and the Scots, who were most fierce in battle, giving no quarter sometimes, 
treated their prisoners with humanity when they were bundled back. Hatred was not the motive which made our men endure all things. It was rather, as I have said, a refusal in their souls to be beaten in manhood by all the devils of war, by all its terrors, or by its beastliness, and at the back of all the thought that the old country was up against it, and that they were there to avert the evil. Young soldiers of ours, not only of officer rank, but of other ranks, as they were called, were inspired at the beginning, and some of them to the end, with a simple boyish idealism. They saw no other causes of war than German brutality. The enemy to them was the monster who had to be destroyed lest the world and its beauty should perish, and that was true so long as the individual German, who loathed the war, obeyed the discipline of the herd leaders and did not revolt against the natural laws which, when the war was once started, bade him die in defense of his own fatherland. Many of those boys of ours made a dedication of their lives upon the altar of sacrifice, believing that by this service and this sacrifice they would help the victory of civilization over barbarism, and of Christian morality over the devil's law. They believed that they were fighting to dethrone militarism, to ensure the happiness and liberties of civilized peoples, and were sure of the gratitude of their nation, should they not have the fate to fall upon the field of honor, but to go home blind or helpless. I have read many letters from boys now dead, in which they express that faith. Do not grieve for me, wrote one of them, for I shall be proud to die for my country's sake. I am happy, wrote another, I quote the tenor of his letters, because though I hate war, I feel that this is the war to end war. We are the last victims of this way of argument. By smashing the German war machine, we shall prove for all time the criminal folly of militarism and junkerdom. There were young idealists like that, and they were to be envied for their faith, which they brought with them from public schools and from humble homes where they had read old books and heard old watchwords. I think, at the beginning of the war, there were many like that. But as it continued year after year, doubts crept in, dreadful suspicions of truth more complex than the old simplicity, a sense of revolt against sacrifice unequally shared, and devoted to a purpose which was not that for which they had been called to fight. They had been told that they were fighting for liberty, but their first lesson was the utter loss of individual liberty under discipline which made the private soldier no more than a number. They were ordered about like galley slaves, herded about like cattle, treated individually and in the mess with utter disregard of their comfort and well-being. Often, as I know, they were detrained at railheads in the wind and rain and by ghastly arrows of staff work kept waiting for their food until they were weak and famished. In the base camps, men of one battalion were drafted into other battalions where they lost old comrades and were unfamiliar with the speech and habits of a crowd belonging to different counties, the Sussex men going to a Manchester regiment, the Yorkshire men being drafted to a Surrey unit. By RTOs and AMLOs and camp commandments and town majors and staff, Puff's men were bullied and bundled about, not like human beings, but like dumb beasts and in a thousand ways injustice, petty tyranny, hard work, degrading punishments for trivial offenses, struck at their souls and made the name of personal liberty a mockery. From their own individuality they argued to broader issues. Was this war for liberty? Were the masses of men on either side fighting with free will as free men? Those Germans, were they not under discipline, each man of them forced to fight whether they liked it or not? compelled to go forward to sacrifice with machine guns behind them to shoot them down if they revolted against their slave drivers what liberty had they to follow their conscience or their judgment theirs not to reason why theirs but to do and die like all soldiers in all armies was it not rather that the masses of men engaged in slaughter were serving the purpose of powers above them rival powers greedy for one another's markets covetous of one another's wealth and callous of the lives of humble men surely if leaders of the warring nations were put together for even a week at some place like hooge or the hohenzollern redoubt afflicted by the usual harassing fire poison gas mine explosions lice rats 
and the stench of rotting corpses, with the certainty of death or dismemberment at week end, they would settle the business and come to terms before the week was out. I heard that proposition put forward many times by young officers of ours, and as an argument against their own sacrifice, they found it unanswerable. End of section 22section 23 of now it can be told by philip gibbs this librivox recording is in the public domain part 8 chapters 5 to 9 chapter 5 the condition and psychology of their own country as they read about it in the paris daily mail which was first to come into their billets filled some of these young men with distress and disgust strengthened into rage when they went home on leave the deliberate falsification of news, the truth of which they heard from private channels, made them discredit the whole presentation of our case and state. They said, propaganda, with a sharp note of scorn. The breezy optimism of public men, preachers, and journalists, never downcast by black news, never agonized by the slaughter in these fields, minimizing horrors and loss and misery, crowing over the enemy, prophesying early victory which did not come, accepting all the destruction of manhood, while they stayed safe, as a necessary and inevitable misfortune, had a depressing effect on men who knew they were doomed to die, in the law of averages, if the war went on. "'Damn their optimism,' said some of our officers. "'It's too easy for those behind the lines. It is only we who have the right of optimism.' It's we who have to do the dirty work. They seem to think we like the job. What are they doing to bring the end nearer? The frightful suspicion entered the heads of some of our men, some of those I knew, that at home people liked the war and were not anxious to end it, and did not care a jot for the sufferings of the soldiers. Many of them came back from seven days' leave, fuming and sullen. Everybody was having a good time. Munition workers were earning wonderful wages and spending them on gramophones, pianos, furs, and the pictures. Everybody was gadding about in a state of joyous exultation. The painted flapper was making herself sick with the sweets of life after office hours in government employ, where she did little work for a lot of pocket money. The society girl was dancing barelegged for war charities, pushing into bazaars for the poor, dear wounded getting her pictures into the paper as a notable war worker, married for the third time in three years. The middle-class cousin was driving staff officers to Whitehall, young gentlemen of the air service to Hendon, junior secretaries to their luncheons. Millions of girls were in some kind of fancy dress with buttons and shoulder straps, breeches and puttees, and they seemed to be making a game of the war and enjoying it thoroughly. Oxford dons were harvesting, and proud of their prowess with the pitchfork, behold their patriotism, while the boys were being blown to bits on the Yezer Canal. Miners were striking for some wages. Factory hands were downing tools for fewer hours at higher pay. The government was paying any price for any labor, while Tommy Atkins drew his one and twopence and made a little go a long way in a wayside estaminet before jogging up the Menin Road to have his head blown off. The government had created a world of parasites and placemen housed in enormous hotels where they were engaged at large salaries upon mysterious unproductive labors which seemed to have no result in front-line trenches. Government contractors were growing fat on the life of war, amassing vast fortunes, juggling with excess profits, battening upon the flesh and blood of boyhood in the fighting lines. These old men, these fat men, were breathing out fire and fury against the Hun, and vowing by all their gods that they would see their last son die in the last ditch rather than agree to any peace except that of destruction. There were fug committees, it was Lord Kitchener's word, at the War Office, the Board of Trade, the Foreign Office, the Home Office, the Ministry of Munitions, the Ministry of Information, 
where officials on enormous salaries smoked cigars of costly brands and decided how to spend vast sums of public money on organization which made no difference to the man stifling his cough below the parapet in a wet fog of flanders staring across no man's land for the beginning of a german attack in all classes of people there was an epidemic of dancing jazzing card-playing theater-going they were keeping their spirits up wonderfully too well for men slouching about the streets of london on leave and wondering at all this gaiety and thinking back to the things they had seen and forward to the things they would have to do people at home it seemed were not much interested in the life of the trenches anyhow they could not understand the soldier listened to excited tales of air raids a bomb had fallen in the next street the windows had been broken many people had been killed in a house somewhere in hackney it was frightful the germans were devils they ought to be torn to pieces every one of them the soldier on leave saw crowds of people taking shelter in underground railways working men among them sturdy lads panic-stricken but for his own wife and children he had an evil sense of satisfaction in these sights it would do them good they would know what war meant just a little they would not be so easy in their damned optimism an air raid lord god did they know what a german barrage was like did they guess how men walked day after day through harassing fire to the trenches did they have any faint idea of life in a sector where men stood slept ate worked under the fire of eight-inch shells five point nines trench mortars rifle grenades machine-gun bullets snipers to say nothing of poison gas long-range fire on the billets in small farmsteads and on every moonlight night air raids above wooden hutments so closely crowded into a small space that hardly a bomb could fall without killing a group of men oh but you have your dugout said a careless little lady the soldier smiled it was no use talking the people did not want to hear the tragic side of things baron's father's old bill seemed to them to typify the spirit of the fighting men off them o kaiser the british soldier was gay and careless of death always shell-fire meant nothing to him if he were killed well after all what else could he expect wasn't that what he was out for the twice-married girl knew a charming boy in the air force he had made love to her even before charlie was done in these dear boys were so greedy for love she could not refuse them poor darlings of course they had all got to die for liberty and that sort of thing it was very sad a terrible thing war perhaps she had better give up dancing for a week until charlie had been put into the casualty lists what are we fighting for asked officers back from leave turning over the pages of the sketch and tattler with pictures of race meetings strike meetings bareback beauties at war bazaars and portraits of profiteers in the latest honors list are we going to die for these swine these parasites and prostitutes is this the war for noble ideals liberty christianity and civilization to hell with all this filth the world has gone mad and we are the victims of insanity some of them said that below all that froth there were deep and quiet waters in england they thought of the anguish of their own wives and mothers their noble patience their uncomplaining courage their spiritual faith in the purpose of the war perhaps at the heart england was true and clean and pitiful perhaps after all many people at home were suffering more than the fighting men in agony of spirit it was unwise to let bitterness poison their brains anyhow they had to go on how long how long o oh lord how long is it going to last asked the london rangers of their chaplain he lied to them and said another three months always he had absolute knowledge that the war would end three months later that was certain courage he said courage to the end of the last lap most of the long service men were dead and gone long before the last lap came it was only the new boys who went as far as victory he asked permission of the general to withdraw nineteen of them from the line to instruct them for communion they were among the best soldiers and not afraid of the ridicule of their fellows because of their religious zeal the chaplain's main purpose was to save their lives for a while and give them a good time and spiritual comfort 
They had their good time. Three weeks later came the German attack on Arras, and they were all killed, every man of them. The chaplain, an Anglican, found it hard to reconcile Christianity with such a war as this, but he did not camouflage the teachings of the master he tried to serve. He preached to his men the gospel of love and forgiveness of enemies. It was reported to the general who sent for him. Look here, I can't let you go preaching soft stuff to my men. I can't allow all that nonsense about love. My job is to teach them to hate. You must either cooperate with me or go. The chaplain refused to change his faith or his teaching, and the general thought better of his intervention. For all chaplains it was difficult. Simple souls were bewildered by the conflict between the spirit of Christianity and the spirit of war. Many of them, officers as well as men, were blasphemous in their scorn of parson stuff, some of them frightfully ironical. A friend of mine watched two chaplains passing by. One of them was a tall man with a crown and star on his shoulder strap. I wonder, said my friend with false simplicity, whether Jesus Christ would have been a lieutenant colonel. On the other hand, many men found help in religion, and sought its comfort with a spiritual craving. They did not argue about Christian ethics and modern warfare. Close to death in the midst of tragedy, conscious in a strange way of their own spiritual being, and of a spirituality present among masses of men above the muck of war, the stench of corruption, and fear of bodily extinction, they groped out toward God. They searched for some divine wisdom greater than the folly of the world for a divine aid which would help them to greater courage. The Spirit of God seemed to come to them across no man's land with pity and comradeship. Catholic soldiers had a simpler, stronger faith than men of Protestant denominations, whose faith depended more on ethical arguments and intellectual reasonings. Catholic chaplains had an easier task. Leaving aside all argument, they heard the confessions of the soldiers, gave them absolution for their sins, said mass for them in wayside barns, administered the sacraments, held the cross to their lips when they fell mortally wounded, anointed them when the surgeon's knife was at work, called the names of Jesus and Mary into dying ears. There was no need of argument here. The old faith, which has survived many wars, many plagues, and the old wickedness of men, was still full of consolation to those who accepted it as little children, and by their own agony hoped for favor from the man of sorrows, who was hanged upon a cross, and found a mother love in the vision of Mary, which came to them when they were in fear and pain and the struggle of death. The padre had a deliberate job to do in the trenches, and for that reason was allowed more liberty in the line than other chaplains. Battalion officers, surgeons, and nurses were patient with mysterious rites which they did not understand, but which gave comfort, as they saw, to wounded men, and the heroism with which many of these priests worked under fire, careless of their own lives, exalted by spiritual fervor, yet for the most part human and humble and large-hearted and tolerant, aroused a general admiration throughout the army. Many of the Protestant clergy were equally devoted but they were handicapped by having to rely more upon providing physical comforts for the men than upon spiritual acts, such as anointing and absolution, which were accepted without question by Catholic soldiers. Yet the Catholic Church, certain of its faith, and all other churches claiming that they teach the gospel of Christ, have been challenged to explain their attitude during the war and the relation of their teaching to the world tragedy, the great crime, which has happened. It will not be easy for them to do so. They will have to explain how it is that German bishops, priests, pastors, and flocks, undoubtedly sincere in their professions of faith, deeply pious, as our soldiers saw in Cologne, and fervent in their devotion to the sacraments on their side of the fighting line, as the Irish Catholics on our side were able to reconcile this piety with their war of aggression. The faith of the Austrian Catholics must be explained in relation to their crimes, if they were criminal, as we say they were, in leading the way to this war by their ultimatum to Serbia. If Christianity has no restraining influence upon the brutal instincts of those who profess and follow its faith, then surely it is time the world abandoned so ineffective a creed and turned to other laws likely to have more influence on human relations. 
That, brutally, is the argument of the thinking world against the clergy of all nations who all claim to be acting according to the justice of God and the Spirit of Christ. It is a powerful argument for the simple mind, rejecting causatry, cuts straight to the appalling contrast between Christian profession and Christian practice, and says, here, in this war, there was no conflict between one faith and another, but the murderous death struggle between many nations holding the same faith, preaching the same gospel, and claiming the same God as their protector. Let us seek some better truth than that hypocrisy. Let us, if need be, in honesty, get back to the savage worship of national gods, the juju of the tribe. My own belief is that the war was no proof against the Christian faith, but rather is a revelation that we are as desperately in need of the Spirit of Christ as at any time in the history of mankind. But I think the clergy of all nations, apart from a heroic and saintly few, subordinated their faith, which is a gospel of charity, to national limitations. They were patriots before they were priests, and their patriotism was sometimes as limited, as narrow, as fierce, and as bloodthirsty as that of the people who looked to them for truth and light. They were often fiercer, narrower, and more desirous of vengeance than the soldiers who fought, because it is now a known truth that the soldiers, German and Austrian, French and Italian and British, were sick of the unending slaughter long before the ending of the war, and would have made a peace more fair than that which now prevails if it had been put to the common vote in the trenches, whereas the Archbishop of Canterbury, the Archbishop of Cologne, and the clergy who spoke from many pulpits in many nations under the cross of Christ still stoked up the fires of hate and urged the armies to go on fighting in the cause of justice for the defense of the fatherland, for Christian righteousness, to the bitter end. Those words are painful to write, but as I am writing this book for truth's sake, at all costs, I let them stand. Chapter 6 The entire aspect of the war was changed by the Russian Revolution, followed by the collapse of the Russian armies and the peace of Brest-Litvotsk, when for the first time the world heard the strange word Bolshevism and knew not what it meant. The Russian armies had fought bravely in the first years of the war, with the oriental disregard of death, under generals in German pay, betrayed by a widespread net of anarchy and corruption so villainous that arms and armaments sent out from England had to be bribed on their way from one official to another, and never reached the front, so foul and callousness of human life the soldiers were put into fighting line without rifle or ammunition, these Russian peasants flung themselves not once but many times against the finest troops of Germany with no more than naked bayonets against powerful artillery and the scythe of machine-gun fire, and died like sheep in the slaughterhouses of Chicago. Is it a wonder that at the last they revolted against this immolation, turned round upon their tyrants, and said, You are the enemy. It is you that we will destroy. By this new revelation they forgot their hatred of Germans. They said, You are our brothers. We have no hatred against you. We do not want to kill you. Why should you kill us? We are all of us the slaves of bloodthirsty castes who use our flesh for their ambitions. Do not shoot us, brothers but join hands against the common tyranny which enslaves our peoples. They went forward with outstretched hands and were shot down like rabbits by some Germans, and by others were not shot, because German soldiers gaped wide-eyed at this new gospel, as it seemed, and said, They speak words of truth. Why should we kill one another? The German warlords ordered a forward movement, threatened their own men with death if they fraternized with Russians, and dictated their terms of peace on the old lines of military conquest. But as Ludendorff has confessed, and as we now know from other evidence, many German soldiers were infected with Bolshevism and lost their fighting spirit. Russia was already in anarchy. Constitutional government had been replaced by the Soviets and by committees of soldiers and workmen. Kremsky had fled. Lenin and Trotsky were the Marat and Danton of the revolution, and decreed the reign of terror. Tales of appalling atrocity, some true, some false, no one can tell how true or how false, 
came through to France and England, it was certain that the whole fabric of society in Russia had dissolved in the wildest anarchy the world has seen in modern times, and that the Bolshevik gospel of brotherhood with humanity was at least rudely interrupted by wholesale murder within its own boundaries. One other thing was certain. Having been relieved of the Russian menace, Germany was free to withdraw her armies on that front and use all her striking force in the West. It should have cautioned our generals to save their men for the greatest menace that had confronted them. But without caution they fought the battles of 1917 in Flanders, as I have told. In 1917, and in the first half of 1918, there seemed no ending to the war by military means. Even many of our generals, who had been so breezy in their optimism, believed now that the end must come by diplomatic means, a peace by understanding. I had private talks with men in high command who acknowledged that the way must be found, and the British mind prepared for negotiations, because there must come a limit to the drain of blood on each side. It was to one man in the world that many men in the armies looked for a way out of this frightful impasse. President Wilson had raised new hope among many men who otherwise were hopeless. He not only spoke high words, but defined the meanings of them. His definition of liberty seemed sound and true, promising the self-determination of peoples. His offer to the German people to deal generously with them if they withdrew their tyranny raised no quarrel among British soldiers. His hope of a new diplomacy, based upon open covenants openly arrived at, seemed to cut at the root of the old evil in Europe by which the fate of peoples had been in the hands of the few. His fourteen points set out clearly and squarely a just basis of peace. His advocacy of a League of Nations held out a vision of a new world by which the great and small democracies should be united by a common pledge to preserve peace and submit their differences to a supreme court of arbitration. Here, at last, was a leader of the world with a clear call to the nobility of men rather than to their base passions, a gospel which would raise civilization from the depths into which it had fallen, and a practical remedy for that suicidal mania which was exhausting the combatant nations. I think there were many millions of men on each side of the fighting line who thanked God because President Wilson had come with a wisdom greater than the folly which was ours to lead the way to an honorable peace and a new order of nations. I was one of them. Months passed, and there was continual fighting, continued slaughter, and no sign that ideas would prevail over force. The Germans launched their great offensive, broke through the British lines, and afterward through the French lines, and there were held in check long enough for our reserves to be flung across the channel, 300,000 boys from England and Scotland, who had been held in hand as the last counters for the pool. The American army came in tidal waves across the Atlantic, flooded our back areas, reached the edge of the battlefields, were a new guarantee of strength. Their divisions passed mostly to the French front, with them and with his own men, magnificent and courage still, and some of ours, Foch, had his army of reserve and struck. So the war ended, after all, by military force, and by military victory greater than had seemed imaginable or possible six months before. In the peace terms that followed, there was but little trace of those splendid ideas which had been proclaimed by President Wilson. On one point after another he weakened, and was beaten by the old militarism which sat enthroned in the council chamber, with its foot on the neck of the enemy. The self-determination of peoples was a hollow phrase signifying nothing. Open covenants openly arrived at were mocked by the closed doors of the conference. When at last the terms were published, their merciless severity, their disregard of racial boundaries, their creation of hatreds and vendettas which would lead, as sure as the sun would rise, to new warfare, staggered humanity, not only in Germany and Austria, but in every country of the world, where at least minorities of people had hoped for some nobler vision of the world's needs, and for some healing remedy for the evils which had massacred its youth. The League of Nations, which it seemed to promise so well, was hedged round by limitations which made it look bleak and barren. 
Still, it was peace, and the rivers of blood had ceased to flow, and the men were coming home again, home again. Chapter 7 The men came home in a queer mood, startling to those who had not watched them out there, and to those who welcomed peace with flags. Even before their homecoming, which was delayed week after week, month after month, unless they were lucky young miners, out for the victory push and back again quickly, strange things began to happen in France and Flanders, Egypt and Palestine. Men who had been long patient became stubbornly impatient. Men who had obeyed all discipline broke into disobedience, bordering on mutiny. They elected spokesmen to represent their grievances, like trade unionists. They answered back to their officers in such large bodies with such threatening anger that it was impossible to give them field punishment number one or any other number, especially as their battalion officers sympathized mainly with their point of view. They demanded demobilization according to their terms of service, which was for the duration of the war. They protested against the gross inequalities of selection by which men of short service were sent home before those who had been out in 1914, 1915, 1916. They demanded justness, fair play, and denounced red tape and official lies. We want to go home, was their shout on parade, a serious business subversive of discipline. Similar explosions were happening in England. Bodies of men broke camp at Folkestone and other camps, demonstrated before town halls, demanded to speak with mayors, generals, any old fellows who were in authority, and refused to embark for France until they had definite pledges that they would receive demobilization papers without delay. Whitehall, the sacred portals of the war office, the holy ground of the horse guards parade, were invaded by bodies of men who had commandeered ambulances and lorries and had made long journeys from their depots. They, too, demanded demobilization. They refused to be drafted out for service to India, Egypt, Archangel, or anywhere. They had done their bit, according to their contract. It was for the war office to fulfill its pledges. Justice was the word on their lips, and it was a word which put the wind up, as soldiers say, any staff officers and officials who had not studied the laws of justice as they concerned private soldiers, and who had dealt with them after the armistice and after the peace as they had dealt with them before, as numbers, counters to be shifted here and there according to the needs of the high command. What was this strange word justice on soldiers' lips? Red tape squirmed and writhed about the business of demobilization. Orders were made, communicated to the men, cancelled even at the railway gates. Promises were made and broken. Conscripts were drafted off to India, Egypt, Mesopotamia, Archangel, against their will and contrary to pledge. Men on far fronts, years absent from their wives at home, were left to stay there, fever-stricken, yearning for home, despairing. And while the old war was not yet cold in its grave, we prepared for a new war against Bolshevik Russia, arranging for the spending of more millions the sacrifice of more boys of ours, not openly with the consent of the people, but on the sly, with the fine art of camouflage. The purpose of the new war seemed to many men who had fought for liberty and outrage against the self-determination of peoples, which had been the fundamental promise of the League of Nations, and a blatant hypocrisy on the part of a nation which denied self-government to Ireland. The ostensible object of our intervention in Russia was to liberate the Russian masses from the bloody tyranny of the Bolsheviks. But this ardor for the liberty of Russia had not been manifest during the reign of Tsardom and Grand Dukes, when there were massacres of mobs in Russia, bloody Sundays in St. Petersburg, pogroms in Riga, floggings of men and girls in many prisons, and when free speech, liberal ideas, and democratic uprisings had been smashed by Cossack knout and by the torture of Siberian exile. Anyhow, many people believed that it was none of our business to suppress the Russian Revolution or to punish the leaders of it, and it was suspected by British working men 
that the real motive behind our action was not a noble enthusiasm for liberty but an endeavor to establish a reactionary government in russia in order to crush a philosophy of life more dangerous to the old order in europe than high explosives and to get back the gold that had been poured into russia by england and france by a strange paradox of history french journalists forgetting their own revolution the cruelties of robespierre and marat the september massacres the torture of marie antoinette in the tuileries the guillotining of many fair women of france and after eighteen seventy the terrors of the commune were most horrified by the anarchy in russia and most fierce in denunciation of the bloody struggle by which a people made mad by long oppression and infernal tyrannies strove to gain the liberties of life thousands of british soldiers newly come from war in france were sullenly determined that they would not be dragged off to the new adventure they were not alone as lord rothermere pointed out the french regiment mutinied on hearing a mere unfounded report that it was being sent to the black sea the united states and japan were withdrawing only a few of our men disillusioned by the ways of peace missing the comradeship of the ranks restless purposeless not happy at home seeing no prospect of good employment said hell why not the army again an archangel or any old wear and volunteered for mr winston churchill's little war after the troubled demobilization came peace pageants and celebrations and flag wavings but all was not right with the spirit of the men who came back something was wrong they put on civilian clothes again looked to their mothers and wives very much like the young men who had gone to business in the peaceful days before august of fourteen but they had not come back the same men something had altered in them they were subject to queer moods queer tempers fits of profound depression alternating with restless desire for pleasure many of them were easily moved to passion when they lost control of themselves many were bitter in their speech violent in opinion frightening for some time while they drew their unemployment pensions they did not make any effort to get work for the future they said that can wait i've done my bit the country can keep me for a while i helped to save it let's go to the movies they were listless when not excited by some show something seemed to have snapped in them their will power a quiet day at home did not appeal to them are you tired of me asked the young wife wistfully aren't you glad to be home it's a dull sort of life said some of them the boys unmarried hung about street corners searched for their pals formed clubs where they smoked incessantly and talked in an aimless way they began the search for work boys without training looked for jobs with wages high enough to give them a margin for amusement after the cost of living decently had been reckoned on the scale of high prices mounting higher and higher not so easy as they had expected the girls were clinging to their jobs would not let go of the pocket money which they had spent on frocks employers favored girl labor found it efficient and on the whole cheap young soldiers who had been very skilled with machine guns trench mortars hand grenades found that they were classed with the ranks of unskilled labor in civil life that was not good enough they had fought for their country they had served england now they wanted good jobs with short hours and good wages they meant to get them and meanwhile prices were rising in the shops suits of clothes boots food anything were at double and treble the price of pre-war days the profiteers were rampant they were out to bleed the men who had been fighting they were defrauding the public with sheer undisguised robbery and the government did nothing to check them england they thought was rotten all the way through who cared for the men who had risked their lives and bore on their bodies the scars of war the pensions doled out to blinded soldiers would not keep them alive the consumptives the gas the paralyzed were forgotten in institutions where they lay hidden from the public eye before the war had been over six months our heroes our brave boys in the trenches were without preference in the struggle for existence 
employers of labor gave them no special consideration in many offices they were told bluntly as i know that they had wasted three or four years in the army and could not be of the same value as boys just out of school the officer class was hardest hit in that way they had gone straight from the public schools and universities to the army they had been lieutenants captains and majors in the air force or infantry battalions or tanks or trench mortars and they had drawn good pay which was their pocket money now they were at loose end hating the idea of office work but ready to knuckle down to any kind of decent job with some prospect ahead what kind of job what knowledge had they of use in civil life none they scanned advertisements answered likely invitations were turned down by elderly men who said i've had two hundred applications and none of you young gentlemen from the army are fit to be my office boy they were the same elderly men who had said we'll fight the last ditch if i had six sons i would sacrifice them all in the cause of liberty and justice elderly officers who had lost their businesses for their country's sake who with a noble devotion had given up everything to do their bit paced the streets searching for work and were shown out of every office where they applied for a post i know one officer of good family and distinguished service who hawked round a subscription book to private houses it took him more courage than he had needed under shell-fire to ring the bell and ask to see the lady of the house he thanked god every time the maid handed back his card and said not at home on the first week's work he was four pounds out of pocket here and there an elderly officer blew out his brains another sucked a rubber tube fastened to a gas jet it would have been better if they had fallen on the field of honor where was the nation's gratitude for men who had fought and died or fought and lived was it for this reward and peace that nearly a million of our men gave up their lives that question is not my question it is the question that was asked by millions of men in england in the months that followed the armistice and it was answered in their own brains by a bitterness and indignation out of which may be lit the fires of the revolutionary spirit at street corners in tramway cars in tea shops where young men talked at the table next to mine i listened to conversations not meant for my ears which made me hear in imagination a far off yet not very far perhaps the dreadful rumble of revolution the violence of mobs led by fanatics it was the talk mostly of demobilized soldiers they asked one another what did we fight for and when other questions such as wasn't this a war for liberty or we fought for the land didn't we then why shouldn't we share the land or why should we be bled white by profiteers they mentioned the government and they laughed in a scornful way the government said one man is a conspiracy against the people all its power is used to protect those who grow fat on big jobs big trusts big contracts it used us to smash the german empire in order to strengthen the, and enlarge the british empire for the sake of those who grabbed the oil wells the gold fields the minerals and the markets of the world chapter eight out of such talk revolution is born and revolution will not be averted by pretending that such words are not being spoken and that such thoughts are not seething among our working classes it will only be averted by cutting at the root of public suspicion by cleansing our political state of its corruption and folly and by a clear strong call of noble-minded men to a new way of life in which a great people believing in the honor and honesty of its leadership and in fair reward for good labor shall face a period of poverty with courage and cooperate unselfishly for the good of the commonwealth inspired by a sense of fellowship with workers of other nations we have a long way to go and many storms to weather before we reach that state if by any grace that is in us and above us we reach it for there are disease and insanity in our present state due to the travail of the war and the education of the war the daily newspapers for many months have been filled with a record of dreadful crimes of violence and passion most of them have been done by soldiers or ex-soldiers the attack on the police station at epson the destruction of the town hall at luton 
revealed a brutality of passion, a murderous instinct, which had been manifested again and again in other riots and street rows and solitary crimes. Those last are the worst because they are not inspired by a sense of injustice, however false, or any mob passion, but by homicidal mania and secret lust. The many murders of young women, the outrages upon little girls, the violent robberies that have happened since the demobilizing of the armies have appalled decent-minded people. They cannot understand the cause of this epidemic after a period when there was less crime than usual. The cause is easy to understand. It is caused by the discipline and training of modern warfare. Our armies, as in all armies, established an intensive culture of brutality. They were schools of slaughter. It was the duty of officers like Colonel Ronald Campbell, O.C. Bayonets, a delightful man, to inspire bloodlust in the brains of gentle boys who instinctively disliked butcher's work. By an ingenious system of psychology he played upon their nature, calling out the primitive barbarism which has been overlaid by civilized restraints, liberating the brute which has been long chained up by law and the social code of gentle life, but lurks always in the secret lairs of the human heart. It is difficult when the brute has been unchained for the purpose of killing Germans to get it into the collar again with the cry of down dog down generals as i have told were against the soft stuff preached by parsons who were not quite militarized though army chaplains they demanded the gospel of hate not that of love but hate when it dominates the psychology of men is not restricted to one objective such as a body of men behind barbed wire it is a spreading poison it envenoms the whole mind like jealousy. It is the green-eyed monster which doth mock the meat it feeds on. Our men, living in holes in the earth like ape-men, were taught the ancient code of the jungle law to track down human beasts in no man's land, to jump upon their bodies in the trenches, to kill quickly, silently in a raid, to drop a hand grenade down a dugout crowded with men, blowing their bodies to bits, to lie patiently for hours in a shell-hole, for a sniping shot at any head which showed, to bludgeon their enemy to death, or spit him on a bit of steel, to get at his throat if need be with nails and teeth. The code of the ape-man is bad for some temperaments. It is apt to become a habit of mind. It may surge up again when there are no Germans present, but some old woman behind an open till, or some policeman with a bull's-eye's lantern and a truncheon, or in a street riot where fellow citizens are for the time being the enemy. Death, their own or other people's, does not mean very much to some who, in the trenches, sat within a few yards of stinking corpses, knowing that the next shell might make such of them. Life was cheap in war. Is it not cheap in peace? The discipline of military life is mainly an imposed discipline, mechanical, and enforced in the last resort not by reason, but by field punishment, or by a firing platoon. Whereas many men were made brisk and alert by discipline, and saw the need for it for the general good, others were always in secret rebellion against its restraints of the individual will, and as soon as they were liberated, broke away from it as slaves from their chains, and did not substitute self-discipline for that which had weighed heavy upon them. With all its discipline, army life was full of lounging, hanging about, waste of time, waiting for things to happen. It was an irresponsible life for the rank and file. Food was brought to them, clothes were given to them, entertainments were provided behind the line, sports organized, their day ordered by high powers. There was no need to think for themselves, to act for themselves. They moved in herds dependent on their leaders. That, too, was a bad training for the individualism of civil life. It tended to destroy personal initiative and willpower. Another evil of the abnormal life of war sowed the seeds of insanity in the brains of men not strong enough to resist it. Sexually, they were starved. For months they lived out of the sight and presence of women, but they came back into villages or towns where they were tempted by any poor slut who winked at them and infected them with illness. Men went to hospital with venereal disease in appalling numbers. 
Boys were ruined and poisoned for life. Future generations will pay the price of war not only in poverty and by the loss of the unborn children of the boys who died, but by an enfeebled stock and the heritage of insanity. The Prime Minister said one day, The world is suffering from shell shock. That was true, but it suffered also from the symptoms of all that illness which comes from syphilis, whose breeding ground is war. The majority of our men were clean-living and clean-hearted fellows who struggled to come unscathed in soul from most of the horrors of war. They resisted the education of brutality and were not envenomed by the gospel of hate. Out of the dark depths of their experience they looked up to the light and had visions of some better law of life than that which led to the world tragedy. It would be a foul libel on many of them to besmirch their honor by a general accusation of lowered morality and brutal tendencies. Something in the spirit of our race and in the quality of our home life kept great numbers of them sound, chivalrous, generous-hearted, in spite of the frightful influence of degradation bearing down upon them out of the conditions of modern warfare. But the weak men, the vicious, the murderous, the primitive, were overwhelmed by these influences, and all that was base in them was intensified, and their passions were unleashed, with what result we have seen, and shall see, to our sorrow and the nation's peril. The nation was in a great peril after this war, and that peril will not pass in our lifetime except by heroic remedies. We won victory in the field, and at the cost of our own ruin. We smashed Germany and Austria and Turkey, but the structure of our own wealth and industry was shattered, and the very foundations of our power were shaken and sapped. Nine months after the armistice, Great Britain was spending at the rate of two million pounds a day in excess of their revenue. She was burdened with a national debt, which had risen from 645 millions in 1914 to 7,800 millions in 1919. The pre-war expenditure of 200 million pounds per annum on the Navy, Army, and Civil Service pensions and interest on national debt had risen to 750 millions. Our exports were dwindling down, owing to decreased output, so that foreign exchanges were rising against us, and the American dollar was increasing in value as our proud old sovereign was losing its ancient standard, so that for all imports from the United States we were paying higher prices, which rose every time the rate of exchange dropped against us. The slaughter of 900,000 men of ours, the disablement of many more than that, had depleted our ranks of labor, and there was a paralysis of all our industry, owing to the dislocation of its machinery for purposes of war, the soaring cost of raw material, the crippling effect of high taxation, the rise in wages to meet high prices, and the lethargy of the workers. Ruin, immense, engulfing, annihilating, to our strength as a nation and as an empire, stares us brutally in the eyes at the time I write this book, and I find no consolation in the thought that other nations in Europe, including the German people, are in the same desperate plight or worse. Chapter 9 The nation, so far, has not found a remedy for the evil that has overtaken us. Rather, in a kind of madness that is not without a strange splendor, like a ship that goes down with drums beating and banners flying, we are racing toward the rocks. At this time, when we are sorely stricken and in dire poverty and debt, we have extended the responsibilities of empire and of world power as though we had illimitable wealth. Our sphere of influence includes Persia, Tibet, Arabia, Palestine, Egypt, a vast part of the Mohammedan world. Yet, if any part of our possessions were to break into revolt or raise a holy war against us, we should be hard-pressed for men to uphold our power and prestige, and our treasury would be called upon in vain for gold. After the war, which was to crush militarism, the Air Force alone proposed an annual expenditure of more than twice as much money as the whole cost of the army before the war. While the armaments of the German people, whom we defeated in the war against militarism, are restricted to a few warships and a navy of a hundred thousand men at a cost reckoned as ten million pounds a year, 
we are threatened with a naval and military program costing three hundred million pounds a year was it for this our men fought was it to establish a new imperialism upheld by the power of guns that nine hundred thousand boys of ours died in the war of liberation i know it was otherwise there are people at the street corners who know and in the tram cars and factories and little houses and mean streets where there are empty chairs and the portraits of dead boys it will go hard with the government of england if it plays a grandiose drama before hostile spectators who refuse to take part in it it will go hard with the nation for it will be engulfed in anarchy at the present time in this august of nineteen nineteen when i write these words five years after another august this england of ours this england which i love because its history is in my soul and its blood is in my body and i have seen the glory of its spirit is sick nigh unto death only great physicians may heal it and its old vitality struggling against disease and its old sanity against insanity our empire is greater now in spaciousness than ever before but our strength to hold it has ebbed low because of much death and a strain too long endured and strangling debts the workman is tired and has slackened in his work in this scheme of life he desires more luxury than our poverty affords he wants higher wages shorter hours and less output reasonable desires in our state before the war unreasonable now because the cost of the war has put them beyond human possibility he wants low prices with high wages and less work it is a false arithmetic and its falsity will be proved by a tremendous crash some crash must come tragic and shocking to our social structure i see no escape from that and only the hope that in that crisis the very shock of it will restore the mental balance of the nation and that all classes will combine under leaders of unselfish purpose and fine vision eager for evolution and not revolution for peace and not for blood for christian charity and not for hatred for civilization and not for anarchy to reshape the conditions of our social life and give us a new working order with more equality of labor and reward duty and sacrifice liberty and discipline of the soul combining the virtue of patriotism with a generous spirit to other peoples across the old frontiers of hate that is the hope but not the certainty it is only by that hope that one may look back upon the war with anything but despair all the lives of those boys whom i saw go marching up the roads of france and flanders to the fields of death so splendid so lovely in their youth will have been laid down in vain if by their sacrifice the world is not uplifted to some plane a little higher than the barbarity which was let loose in europe they will have been betrayed if the agony they suffered is forgotten and the war to end war leads to preparations for new more monstrous conflict or is war the law of human life is there something more powerful than kaisers and castes which drives masses of men against other masses in death struggles which they do not understand are we really poor beasts in the jungle striving by tooth and claw high velocity and poison gas for the survival of the fittest in an endless conflict if that is so then god mocks at us or rather if that is so there is no god such as we men may love with love for men the world will not accept that message of despair and millions of men today who went through the agony of the war are inspired by the humble belief that humanity may be cured of its cruelty and stupidity and that a brotherhood of peoples more powerful than a league of nations may be founded in the world after its present sickness and out of the conflict of its anarchy that is the new vision which leads men on and if we can make one step that way it will be better than the backward fall which civilization took when germany played the devil and led us all into the jungle the devil in germany had to be killed there was no other way except by helping the germans to kill it before it mastered them now let us exorcise our own devils and get back to kindness toward all men of good will that also is the only way to heal the heart of the world and our own state let us seek the beauty of life and god's truth somehow 
remembering the boys who died too soon, and all the falsity and hatred of these past five years. By blood and passion there will be no healing. We have seen too much blood. We want to wipe it out of our eyes and souls. Let us have peace. End of section 23 End of Now It Can Be Told by Philip Gibbs Recording by Walt Allen, Falmouth, Maine See my web page for the book at tinyurl.com slash philipgibbs.